people for coverage of a House Government Operations Subcommittee hearing on U.S. anti-drug policy in the Andean nations of Peru, Bolivia, and Colombia. Government Operations Chairman Representative John Conyers used the hearing to release three audits, which he says indicate mismanagement, lack of effectiveness, and lack of accountability in the nation's Andean anti-drug policy. With that background, here now is Wednesday's hearing. Subcommittee holds its oversight hearing on the Andean Initiative. Uh, <clears throat> let me begin the discussion by pointing out there seems to be a reality gap in the drug war. In Washington, the talk is a victory. Uh, the President told us two years ago that victory over drugs is our cause and we're going to win. The drugs are Robert Martinez told the National Press Club that our successes on the supply side have contributed to reducing drug use. Today we find these statements are bravado and not substantiated by the facts. The reality is that the drug war abroad is not succeeding and we're going to examine the results of three audits today, two by the General Accounting Office, the other by the State Department's own Inspector General. The audits focus on the military and law enforcement components of the Andean strategy in Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia. The reports have come to very surprising but similar conclusions that the drug war abroad has serious problems, problems of management, waste, abuse, and limited effectiveness. There are problems with determining effectiveness. Only 1% of the cocaine is being stopped from Bolivia. In Peru, cocoa cultivation is increasing while cocoa leaf seizures have decreased in 1990, from 500 metric tons down to 39 metric tons. No measurable criteria has been developed for evaluating the effectiveness of the assistance in achieving counter-narcotics objectives. There are problems with management. There's no mechanism for monitoring the military assistance in Colombia. Police training assistance is being used for counterinsurgency purposes in violation of our own policy in Peru. The Inspector General questions the rationale and the potential dangers of involving the Bolivian Army. There are problems of waste and abuse that must be addressed and the report makes clear that lax management controls are leading to abuse of drug funds. For example, in Bolivia, we paid more than $100,000 for a half a dozen trucks and only half of them have been delivered. Uh, in 1989, over 50 vehicles were missing and unaccounted for and cash advances over totaling $100,000 or more were being written off. And yet, uh, these problems were supposed to have been solved in 1988. Uh, helicopters are being underutilized in Bolivia, yet there are uh, plans to uh, immediately purchase more. Uh, two out of 13 patrol boats used in the Riverine program uh, can communicate uh, with each other. Six out of 16 helicopters don't have high frequency radios. And uh, there's difficulty in getting, uh, getting the, the ones, the right ones installed. There are serious human rights problems and the GAO uh, questions the State Department's recent determination that Peru is making progress in meeting our United States legislative requirements for receiving military and economic uh, assistance in fiscal year 1991. 
In 1990, the administration adopted goals for cutting dangerous drugs entering the United States. The two-year goal was a 15 percent reduction and a 10-year goal of 60 percent reduction. We're not meeting these goals and we're trying here to find out why. We've not created an effective counter-narcotics program according to everything I've examined and that too much money is being wasted and the government is not working very well or being managed very successfully. Our communities in the United States, it goes without saying, are still ridden with drugs. So what's the problem? Do we need to continue spending more than $11 billion on a drug war that we are each year? And uh, we're, we're here to try to get to some answers. I'm glad that uh, we're joined here by Frank Horton, Glenn English, and Al McCandless. And I yield now to Frank Horton. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm pleased to join with you for this important oversight hearing on the status of the President's Andean drug strategy. The General Accounting uh, Office and the State Department's Office of Inspector General have performed a critical task of examining weaknesses in our assistance program programs in Colombia, Bolivia, and Peru. I would like to welcome Mr. Conahan and Mr. Funk and thank them for their invaluable contributions to this committee's oversight responsibility. I also would like to thank the officials from the State Department who will come before us to answer to the findings in these audits. I do not have to remind my colleagues, especially those who have recently traveled to the Andean region, that the social, economic, and political com uh, uh, complexion of these countries changed so rapidly that a, the situation a month ago may be significantly different than the situation today. Therefore, the testimony of the State Department officials is crucial for informing the committee of dated material or problems that have been addressed since the audits were performed. At this point, I'd like to make a few comments about United States military and law enforcement assistance to Colombia, Bolivia, and Peru. I received letters from some of my own constituents who questioned the strategy's insistence upon providing military and law enforcement aid to the Andean countries. It's obvious to me, however, that the policy of including this type of assistance is fundamental to a comprehensive and effective anti-drug uh, effort. The jungles and mountains of the Andean uh, t uh, terrain have provided protection and isolation for cocaine processing labs, airstrips, and hideouts for criminals at the highest levels of the drug trade. In most cases, these groups are better funded and equipped with more sophisticated weaponry than the government's trying to fight them. In order for law enforcement and security forces to confront these dangerous traffickers and dismantle drug organizations in these remote areas, special technical assistance and equipment is essential to the host country's success in the anti-drug struggle. There's also the larger threat that the international drug trade poses to our own national security and to the security and stability of other nations. Do we quickly forget the thousands of brutal murders and kidnappings of members of the media and judicial system by drug traffickers, which just last year had the population of Colombia lying in perpetual fear and terror? And what about Peru, where violent political insurgents continue to work hand in hand with traffickers to further their own objective of overthrowing the present democracy? Neglecting to take a stand against the powerful and dangerous drug trafficking cartels would eventually leave these and other legitimate governments prey to the control of the world's most brutal criminals. A government must be able to maintain civilian law and order before it can effectively implement anti-narcotics programs and improve its social and economic infrastructure. Therefore, the Indian strategy is correct as a multifaceted, long-term approach which legitimately includes significant military and law enforcement aid. All of this is not to suggest that economic and trade assistance is of little value. It is of tremendous in value, uh, value. In fact, I'm happy to report that I and several of my colleagues on the committee have co-sponsored a trade initiative, H.R. 661, that would authorize the President to grant duty-free treatment to eligible products from the Andean countries this much-needed uh, legislation is now successfully winding its way through the um, legislative process. 
Mr. Chairman, I look forward to this hearing uh, as a means in which to examine the most productive ways to continue and improve upon the Andean st uh, strategy, and I compliment you on calling the hearings. Well, thank you for a, a very thoughtful statement, Mr. Harden. Uh, Mr. Glenn English. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I want to commend you for uh, this hearing and uh, certainly for this inquiry. We've seen over uh, the past decade numerous times both this administration and, past, and the past administration has been critical of the Congress for what they would call micromanagement uh, as far as the war on drugs is concerned. And micromanagement, unfortunately, has been necessary for all too often we have found that uh, is either a lack of interest, lack of focus, lack of ability, lack of funds. All of these lacking in dealing with an effective war on drugs. It appears with this new inquiry, this new investigation by the GAO that once again we find that uh, the administration's war on drugs is not going well and the Indian strategy is one that is not being as effective as it should be. I think, Mr. Chairman, what this means is that the Congress is once again going to have to become involved. We're going to have to once again micromanage, as the administration would say, a problem in the war on drugs. The problem that we have had over the past decade with the past administration and this administration is a genuine lack of interest in this problem, in dealing with this problem. It has lagged behind as far as being a priority item for this administration and the past administration time and time again. The American people have been the ones who have demanded action. The American people are the ones who have insisted that we deal with this problem. And once again, it appears that uh, the American people are going to have to prod this administration to take this matter seriously. Mr. Chairman, I'm also disturbed by the fact it's not simply a lack of interest. But there also seems to be a conscious effort on the part of those who have the responsibility for leading the war on drugs. And I'm primarily talking about the drug czar himself in bearing this problem and trying to smother the, any publicity with regard to what the facts are in the war on drugs. It's recently come to my attention, Mr. Chairman, that we're seeing a substantial increase in the amount of heroin that's coming into the United States and that this uh, information has been uh, working its way through uh, this administration to be included in their reports with regard to the problems that we face in the war on drugs. But it's also come to my attention that this information is not to be included in any reports by this administration with regard to the war on drugs. And the order came from the office of the drug czar himself. And Mr. Chairman, if we have, uh, as our leader, in this nation, a drug czar who, in fact, uh, refuses to provide the American people with what is, in fact, taking place in the war on drugs, then I think that it uh, should be no mystery that we're having difficulty in winning this war. I know of no other war in which uh, this nation has been successful where the general has refused to provide the American people with the facts in that effort. I'm hopeful, Mr. Chairman, that uh, the hearings that you're holding today will shine a little light on some of the problems in the war on drugs. Perhaps give the American people uh, something of a glimpse of why the war is not succeeding. And I hope, uh, Mr. Chairman, that it will rekindle once again, interest in the American people, the Congress, and the news media in digging and finding out what the real facts are. 
This is an important issue. It's an issue that we cannot afford to ignore. And Mr. Chairman, this is certainly a war this nation cannot afford to lose. Again, I want to commend you and thank you for the hearings. Well, I want to thank you, Mr. English, for uh, your comments that start us off. Uh, the chair would like to recognize Mr. Al McCandless, who has worked on the subcommittee that has spent a great deal of time on the Andean Initiative, and he is probably the most uh, recent member to have been over in that area. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> I think we need to outline <coughs> pardon me, a couple of thoughts for the benefit of our opening remarks, and that is that uh, we as a country in the United States have traditionally approached the problem from our point of view which is admirable except for the fact that there are different mores and customs, historical background in these countries which do not necessarily lend themselves exactly to the cookie cutter patterns that we expect. And I think that Peru is probably the best example of this based upon Peru's internal problems, its historical economic uh, activities which have been all negative to the country, and the fact that Peru has now found a way by which to work with the United States in a manner that might be foreign and to some people in the United States not to their liking. Uh, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. The problem in Peru is one basically of a domestic policy in terms of their economy. The inflation there the rate in 1990 was 7,650 percent. In 1991, <clears throat> the re <clears throat> inflation rate is expected to be reduced to 150 percent. In September of this year, it was 5.6 percent, and we hope that the figures that are being given to us, 1992, the inflation rate will be 38 percent. Peru's reserves were in the red less than a year ago, and now they currently are approaching a positive $1 billion surplus. The point I'm trying to make here is that the Huaga Valley, which is famous for its cocoa leaves and growing, had a regular population not too many years ago of somewhere in the neighborhood of 25,000 campesinos. Because of all of these problems, which I have very briefly outlined, the people in the urban communities could not make a living, could not feed their families, and so they left the urban areas to grow cocoa on property which did not belong to them, and in the process of doing so have been able to solve their own personal economic problem to the degree that there are probably now somewhere in the neighborhood of 250,000 people in the same geographical area, along with the problems of the two insurgent groups. Let me conclude by giving you an example of what I'm talking about here with respect to the new president and how he sees the future relative to the problem that we here in this full committee and subcommittee are looking at. I'd like to quote uh, from some comments that he has recently made. This is uh, President Fujimora of Peru. We have decided to deal directly with the United States, but not from merely repressive viewpoint which has been the case for many years. We have a different concept in mind. We do not consider the cocoa farmer a criminal, but a person to negotiate with. The objective, to encourage him to abandon the cocoa crop in exchange for alternate crops. Now that's a capsule comment of the leader of one of the three major countries and how he sees our relationship. And interestingly enough, we have reached agreements back in May of this year with the Fujimura government in terms of not the eradication aspect of it, which has been futile over the years and a very poor policy because it didn't accomplish anything, but to concentrate on the interdiction aspect of it. I look forward to the hearing, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling them. Well, thank you very much. Well, you know how we feel. Now let's find out what it is we can do in terms of throwing some additional light on this uh, very tangled subject. I call now panel one, Frank Conahan and Sherman Funk. 
uh, and their assistants. Frank Conahan, Assistant Comptroller General of the United States, been here very regularly. John Brummett is with him. Sherman Funk is the Inspector General at the Department of State since 1987 and supervises all of the diplomatic and consular posts worldwide, oversees the standard audit and investigative programs. Uh, with him is John Deering. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show all of the witnesses indicated in the affirmative. As you know, we have your uh, statements, and uh, we want to get, we, we, we're looking to you to find out uh, where some of these naughty problems are and, and what we can do about them. This is not a bashing session on the administration, but we've got to get to the bottom of this. We've been doing this Andean number for uh, years now, and we seem to be going around in circles. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Assistant Comptroller General, I'll ask you to initiate this discussion this morning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. We appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning to discuss the uh, recently uh, issued reports that we have completed <clears throat> on Colombia and Peru. At the outset, I'd like to say that the United States is further along in implementing the strategy in Colombia uh, than in Peru uh, for the very reason that uh, the Colombian government uh, has given uh, a good bit of commitment to, to the program. Uh, we think, based on uh, our review, that uh, Peru must uh, overcome some very, very serious difficulties uh, before the strategy can be effective in that country. In addition, there are uh, management uh, problems uh, in uh, both countries in terms of uh, implementing the programs. Uh, the United States needs to uh, strengthen its uh, oversight. It needs to uh, come up with uh, mechanisms to uh, monitor the uh, military aid. And it's got to uh, put in place uh, systems to assure that the assistance is used efficiently uh, and effectively. And finally, uh, human rights remains a concern in both uh, Colombia and Peru. Let me uh, uh, provide a few more details starting with uh, uh, Peru. I would say that uh, the program uh, in Peru has, has essentially just begun. Uh, and there has been uh, very little progress uh, in stopping uh, drug activities. For uh, fiscal years 1990 and 1991, uh, $19 million each year was provided for uh, law enforcement aid, primarily for activities in the uh, upper Wyaga Valley where most of the coca leaf is, uh, is grown. But I must say again that it's had uh, minimal impact. Uh, an example that is in our uh, prepared statement uh, of the minimal impact is that the amount of cocaine base seized throughout Peru in 1990 was about four metric tons. Uh, that can be characterized as about one week's production from one town in the upper valley. Uh, furthermore, the drug enforcement uh, agency uh, reported that for the early months of 1991, chemicals used in the process to process cocaine were in abundant supply uh, in the valley. The uh, United States uh, had planned to uh, provide uh, Peru with military assistance in uh, fiscal year 1990 to the tune of uh, $36 million. Uh, Peru uh, refused to accept that assistance. Uh, the United States proposed to uh, provide uh, a similar amount to uh, Peru in, uh, in 1991. Uh, Peru uh, finally uh, did uh, agree to accept that. However, as a result of discussions between uh, the State Department and the Congress here in recent months, that amount has been reduced to uh, $25 million. I believe that uh, some of the details still need to be worked out between the administration and the congressional committees on that. And then after that, the State Department is and the Defense Department is going to have to go back to the government of Peru to uh, work out the details on, on the program uh, itself. Uh, as you mentioned in your uh, opening statement, Mr. Chairman, the Department of State did make a determination in July of 1991 uh, that uh, Peru is implementing programs to, one, uh, reduce the flow of cocaine, two, improve the protection of human rights, and three, establish effective control over the uh, military and law enforcement agencies. This was a legislative stipulation needed in order to release economic and military aid for fiscal year 1991. 
As I will mention in a moment, we found significant problems uh, with respect to uh, human rights and control over the military and the police that raised real questions uh, about whether or not the Department of State was uh, in a position to, uh, to make that uh, determination. As I said, the uh, U.S. Uh, programs in Peru will likely not become effective until Peru makes significant progress in uh, overcoming uh, serious uh, obstacles. Our uh, report has a, uh, a listing of, of all those obstacles. I would just like to cite a few at, uh, at this point. Uh, in uh, November, uh, the uh, uh, President of Peru announced that uh, he would form an agency uh, to control uh, both the military and police units involved in uh, counter-narcotics. Uh, that uh, agency uh, has been established, but uh, as of the time of our review this summer, it, it had no budget and it existed uh, only on paper. It, in fact, does not, does not operate. Uh, the military uh, has not demonstrated over time a commitment to coordinate operations with the police. I think uh, we're beginning to see some signs that they might be willing to do that, but uh, nothing that we could call uh, uh, accomplished uh, actions. Uh, thirdly, corruption is pervasive throughout all levels of the civilian government, the military, and the uh, law enforcement agencies. Uh, for example, earlier this year, uh, we have information that one army unit allowed a drug trafficker to land his plane, load his drugs, and take off with any, without any interference uh, at all. Uh, although uh, the Peru Peru's president has replaced mid and senior level officials suspected of corruption, the State Department concluded in March of this year that the action did not reduce uh, corruption. As recently as early summer, uh, various administration officials stated to us and others that the Peruvian government had done little to investigate or prosecute military and police officials for corruption. As I mentioned, human rights abuses by insurgents as well as by the military and law enforcement units uh, continues to be uh, a concern. Uh, the State Department in its annual report listed widespread and egregious human rights violations earlier this year. In the uh, OAS report in April of uh, this year, uh, they identified it, uh, human rights abuses by military throughout South America. Uh, Fifty of them uh, occurred uh, in Peru. As I mentioned, the agencies do not have a re reliable system in Peru for evaluating the effectiveness of uh, U.S. counter-narcotics aid or for monitoring uh, U.S. Uh, military aid. Uh, the State Department uh, seems to uh, be establishing effective control over uh, U.S. equipment used by the police, but this uh, does not run to uh, uh, the military and a um, substantial amount of training is being provided to uh, police uh, special uh, operations units that do not have primary uh, counter-narcotics missions. Matter of fact, I think that during the period of our review, it was as much as 44, 45 percent of the total training provided. Let me now turn uh, to uh, Colombia. I, th I should say that uh, although uh, the problems in Colombia are not of a magnitude as they are in Peru, uh, they do uh, inhibit effective implementation of the program, and I think that they're very important. Uh, Overall, uh, they've not instituted controls necessary to assure that the uh, aid is used uh, as intended. Uh, military aid began in uh, late 1989, early 1990, uh, continued throughout 1990, but uh, there was no plan uh, for the utilization of this uh, equipment until the end of uh, fiscal year 1990. As a matter of fact, early into fiscal year 1991. Additional uh, military assistance is being provided. Uh, the plan is being uh, revised. Those revisions have not been completed. And state and defense departments cannot tell us when that will be occur, when that will occur. Uh, secondly, uh, U.S. officials uh, have not begun to uh, monitor uh, the Colombian military's use of uh, aid and therefore cannot assure it as being used primarily for counter-narcotics purposes. The concern here Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, is that it could be used primarily for uh, counterinsurgency uses or other non-drug related uh, purposes. Uh, that's, that's a concern. I think that uh, Mr. Funk will talk about that uh, in the country that he is going to uh, talk about. And finally, there is no reliable system for evaluating the success of the programs in Colombia. Performance criteria uh, as, uh, with specific time frames and quantitative goals uh, has not been established. The State Department tells us uh, it's working on uh, these criteria, but uh, we haven't uh, uh, seen them uh, as yet. 
I mentioned that uh, human uh, rights uh, remain a concern and my uh, a statement as well as the reports that we have uh, tendered to uh, this committee uh, uh, lists some details in that regard. That summarizes uh, my statement, Mr. Chairman. I would say very good, but uh, it's very discouraging. Uh, your statement is uh, very good, and uh, your written statement even expands uh, some of the detail further. We appreciate it. Inspector General, uh, Mr. Sherman Funk. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, I also am pleased to be here to have a chance to comment on. Say again. Turn on your mic. Okay. Thank you. I'm also pleased to be here to discuss our audit report on Bolivia. Uh, we've issued it in two versions, classified and unclassified. I provided both versions to the committee, but today I'll be talking only about the unclassified portion. Uh, I've submitted my full statement for the record, so if I may, I'll just, just discuss a summary of what we reported. Uh, let me start by explaining why we chose Bolivia for the uh, location of our audit. I wanted, when we were preparing our plan, to select a country that met four criteria. First, one where the department has had a counter-narcotics program in place for an appreciable period of time, so that we would not be looking at an activity that was starting from ground zero. Second, I wanted a country where we had previously reviewed our drug control efforts so that we would have at least a rough baseline from which to measure progress. And in fact, in 1988, we did conduct an audit in uh, both Peru and Bolivia. Third, a country that was cocaine-oriented because cocaine, despite the recent upsurge in heroin use, remarked by Mr. English, uh, remains the hard drug of choice in the United States. And finally, I wanted a country in which success, however it's measured, remains a realistic possibility. Bolivia, which produces about 35 percent of the world's coke and cocaine, uh, was the only country that met all of these criteria. And subsequently, Mr. Chairman, the committee asked me to review some additional aspects of our counter-narcotics effort in Bolivia, focusing primarily on issues relating to law enforcement, military assistance, and human rights. And we incorporated those into the audit. Let me just discuss a brief background of Bolivia. The country has the dubious distinction of being one of the Western Hemisphere's poorest nations and the world's second largest producer of coca and cocaine. The Bolivian economy is very dependent on more than 60,000 metric tons of coca grown each year. In fact, the coca industry in Bolivia generated about $650 million, or about 15 percent of Bolivia's official gross domestic product, and employed about 350,000 individuals. This is about 15 percent of the employable population. I might add that the sale of coca, the export of coca, is double in value the total other exports of uh, agricultural exports of uh, uh, Bolivia. Uh, we were told flatly by senior people in the private sector of uh, Bolivia that if coca were to be completely eradicated today, the economy of Bolivia would collapse. Most coca in Brazil is processed and grown in the uh, initial processing is grown in the uh, uh, Chapari uh, province, uh, which is about the size of Rhode Island. And there that the coca is grown and converted to cocoa paste. The paste is then transported to the north of uh, and more remote areas of the eastern part of Bolivia, where it's further refined into cocaine uh, base and uh, HCL, the cocaine uh, itself. A program to reduce the supply of Bolivian cocaine is obviously a difficult and long-term task. I'm concerned because the temperament of the American public is oriented short, toward short hits, short successes, the quick hit kind of thing. Uh, it's difficult to operate in that kind of environment when you're planning a long-term task. And I believe and I would urge the, the committee to understand that if we are going to try to be successful, it ain't going to happen overnight. It's going to involve restructuring of the entire economy in, in Bolivia. There are two key underpinnings to any successful program in Bolivia. First, the political will and the ability of the Bolivian government to carry out drug control activities efficiently and effectively. And second, the concern is the long-standing fragmentation and lack of coordination between agencies, particularly at the field level. And I'm happy to note that in this regard, when we first went there three years ago, we found very severe coordination problems in Washington, 
uh, as well as uh, in La Paz. Uh, that, the Washington end of it has pretty much uh, cleared up now. We do not have major coordination problems in Washington, nor do we have it within the embassy. We do have it, as I will discuss in a moment, in the field. The major component of our strategy is a five-year, five $2.2 billion strategy set forth in the Cartagena summit in February of 1990. Under that strategy, Bolivia is scheduled to receive about $830 million between 1990 and 1994, the greatest share of any of the three countries. These are divided into law enforcement, military training and equipment, and economic development and assistance in the broad sense. Let me start with discussing law enforcement. Funding for law enforcement activities in 1990 totaled about $24.8 million, roughly one-fifth of the uh, drug control assistance to Bolivia. We found that the uh, situation in 19 1991 notably was improved over what we found in 1988, notably improved. Nevertheless, we did find that the program suffers in the field from a lack of leadership and oversight resulting in poor interagency coordination at the operating level. The Drug Administration, under the aggressive uh, direction of Embassy La Paz, helps Bolivia to develop and enforce its own law enforcement capability, eventually toward becoming self-sufficient. However, the Bolivian law enforcement program, although it's made progress, it still has to realize that self-sufficiency is some years away. DOD personnel provide technical and military assistance, such as training, weapons, and ammunition. And the law enforcement personnel from DEA and the Border Patrol and so forth accompany the National Police on operations. DOD personnel are forbidden to do so by their rules of engagement. UMAPAR, the Bolivian National Drug Police and its U.S. advisors, carry out their assignments in a corrupt, inhospitable, and sometimes dangerous, very dangerous environment. I want to say I take off my hat now to them because I think we're deeply in their debt for the courage and dedication they demonstrate day after day in carrying out a very difficult job. In response to the committee's request, we tried to determine the impact of U.S. resources, training, and equipment on the Bolivian drug traffic. We tried to do this by comparing intended interdiction missions with actual results. However, because the requisite data was simply unavailable or in, uh, incompatible, we could not draw any realistic correlation between the effect of U.S. assistance and interdiction operations. Clearly, though, Interdiction results, as measured by seized statistics alone, are still modest. They account for about 1% of the illicit drugs produced. I want to also say, however, that it should be understood 1%. 1%. Sure. Yes, sir. How do you know what's 1%? Any time, Mr. Can you tell me how, many, how much in the way of drugs is imported in this country in any given year? Do you know exactly how much there is? Mr. English, you put your finger on one of the major weaknesses in the drug program. So in effect, you can't say this 1% because you don't have any idea what the total is, do you? It's computed on a kind of a, a math. Excuse I can, me, Mr. Chairman. I can explain how it's done. We have good photographic coverage of the entire nation. We know where the, the, how much coca is being grown. We can measure that fairly precisely. We also know how much we actually seize. And so we extrapolate based on the what we would project is the total uh, project, uh, production of, co of uh, coke into cocaine, and we know what we've seized. What we've seized is 1 percent of our projection, basically. That's assuming all of it comes to the United States. The difficulty is, in all statistics in the drug area, for example, the national drug strategy calls for a 15 percent reduction of hard drugs entering the United States in 1992 and a 60 percent reduction some years later. But we don't really know how much is coming into the country. So it's exceedingly difficult to come up with a precise figure. That understates it. Increasingly, what we're doing now is that 99% of the labs destroyed in Bolivia are small PACE labs, rather than the larger HCL labs. But this is due in part to the very success of continuing law enforcement operations in the Tripari, which have forced the major traffickers to move their bigger processing facilities to more remote areas in the northern and eastern area. We also found a very marked improvement in coordination of intelligence activities at Embassy La Paz, effectively supporting interdiction efforts in the field of a large-scale nature, but less effective in, in supporting routine day-to-day -day operations. And we found that a lack of coordination between U.S. agencies operating in the field 
impeded counter-narcotics work there. Now, officials in Washington and in La Paz vehemently disagreed with this finding. They asserted uh, in their turn that we have excellent communication and coordination in the field and that we simply failed to recognize that. What I suspect is happening here is, I guess I can call it a headquarters syndrome. People in the embassy know that they are communicating well, that they are co coordinating well, and they're convinced that they're issuing clear instructions to the field. On the other hand, the grunts in the field who are carrying out this mission uh, find it difficult to, to accept this because they don't see the same clarity uh, or narrow focus of uh, uh, instructions. And this, this is compounded in the case of counter-narcotics work because we're dealing with different agencies working under different ground rules and reporting through different chains of command. I might discuss a parallel in the need for a centralized leadership of the drug effort in the field. In Desert Storm, on a vastly larger scale, we also had many different entities, but these different entities were clearly operating under a single authority, U.S. Central Command. And I would suspect there may be a parallel we can draw there. In terms of the DOD role, we found, despite many uh, uh, directives that have been issued in that, the fact of the matter is that, the, our, in our opinion, the skills of the DOD advisors on the scene were not being ex uh, effectively exploited in the field, in part because there's some confusion, we believe, about their role in mission in Bolivia. We believe that DOD expertise in this area, in particular, for example, the air assault kind of operations that we conduct using choppers, and um, when we have DOD people with great expertise in that, can be of substantial benefit. In terms of military assistance, in 1990, assistance to the Bolivian military all Bolivian military, Army, Navy, Air Force, totaled 36.6 million. Since the 1980s, the early 1980s, the U.S. has provided counter-narcotics assistance to the Bolivian Air Force and the Navy, and now we are doing it to the Army as well. With U.S. advice and assistance, the, the Bolivian government has established an aviation task force within the Air Force and a riverine task force within the Navy. We pay for most of the operation and maintenance of both task forces. We found, since our 1988 visit, Substantial improvements have been made, but also that some of the same problems that we had identified then exist today. In 1990, for the first time, narcotics were, counter narcotics agreements were negotiated between U.S. and Bolivian governments, which included the Bolivian Army in counter drug activities. This decision was intensely debated within Bolivia. Uh, the fear was voiced by many in Bolivia that an invigorated army might endanger the very fragile democratic institutions established in Bolivia and lead to an escalation of human rights abuses and drug-related corruption. Conversely, there's an argument to be made, which I personally uh, agree with, that it would be uh, a stabilizing influence if you have a government in, in Bolivia that's supported by the military. In the past 166 years, there have been 188 military governments in Bolivia, many of them taking power through coup. In fact, not most of them taking power through coups. Uh, it's therefore essential to have stability in Bolivia to have the military on board and supporting the government in such a critical thing as a counter-narcotics effort. However, as a prerequisite to this involvement of the military, we think it's needed that the two governments agree on the Army's exact role, how it will coordinate with other drug control units, where it will operate, and how it will be staffed and trained. We do not believe that that clarity exists today. The Bolivian Air Force is, supports the, uh, uh, what we call the BAF, the Bolivian Air Force Red Devils. Uh, they're assisting the uh, counter-narcotics effort directly. Uh, they're funded by the uh, uh, State Department. And we found that the Red Devils are by far the best run aviation program supported by the State Department. Their counter-narcotics uh, air strength includes a total of 16 U.S.-owned uh, UH-1 choppers and four confiscated Cessna fixed-wing aircraft. The Cessnas are owned by the Bolivian Air Force but maintained with our money. We were puzzled to find that current plans call for delivery of an additional six helicopters in the near future, despite what appears to us to be a clear underutilization of its present choppers, even taking into account the difficult conditions under which they operate and the age of the aircraft. We also found that plans for a fixed-wing aircraft program 
primarily funded by defense, have not sufficiently identified the counter-narcotics role of the aircraft, nor have they addressed interagency coordination issues. It appears that the fixed-wing aircraft will be operated and maintained by defense under defense contractor, and the helicopters will be operated and maintained by, uh, our, by ourselves under a State Department contract. We therefore recommend that the Department review the fixed-wing requirements and the planned utilization of them. We also recommended that before spending millions of dollars to, in U.S. assistance to refurbish Bolivian-owned aircraft, consideration should be given to using aircraft already owned and supported by the U.S., such as the INM T-65 Turbo Thrush fixed-wing airplane. If you look at the map of Bolivia, and you can see it on the GAO map up there on the, to the right, although it doesn't give a good picture of the interior, a very simple look at a map of Bolivia emphasizes the overwhelming importance of, <laughs> of a riverine strategy. In much of the interior and toward the north and east of Bolivia, road traffic is virtually impossible. Transport is dependent upon the rivers. In effect, if the rivers are controlled, a substantial reduction would then follow in the amount of uh, precursor chemicals going in and the completed process chemicals, uh, uh, cocaine coming out. We reported in 1988 that the riverine interdiction operations were ineffective and quite possibly compromised by corrupt Bolivian Navy officials. The program has expanded since then, both in terms of equipment and scope, but we still believe that its success remains uncertain. We've identified several problems continuing to detract from the riverine program, which include lack of communications gear, lack of spare engines, inappropriate patrol boats, shortage of assault boats, and ina inadequate control of assets. Crop control. Let me talk about crop control, which is critical. On paper, <clears throat> the Bolivian government has an outstanding crop control program. The government is able and authorized to give $2,000 per hectare of coca voluntarily evacuate, uh, eradicated. Plus, in addition, the government can furnish up to $20,000 in loans to each farmer who participates in the voluntary eradication program. Now, the eradication program exceeded its goal in 1990, as the chairman mentioned earlier, for the first time actually yielding a net reduction in land under cultivation of coca. About 8,100 hectares were eradicated in 1990, a 200% increase over 89. Unfortunately, that's not likely to be repeated this year. And the basic reason is a rising price of cocoa leaf. The average price now is about $55 per hundredweight. And at this price, the farmers find it more profitable to sell coca than to eradicate it voluntarily for compensation or switching to alternative crops, particularly in view of the, the fact that if you go into alternative crops, you have a long growing period uh, as well as uh, market difficulties. The law allows mandatory eradication of illegally grown coca but the government has been reluctant to enforce this. The embassy has vigorously been urging the government to uh, indulge in more forcible eradication, to enforce the, the law on the books now, and because economic assistance to the uh, Andean countries is, is uh, conditioned on them meeting certain eradication goals, the embassy has a very powerful argument. Nevertheless, uh, it appears that the, this year's goal of 7,000 hectares eradicated will not be met. Economic assistance is the third and perhaps the most critical aspect of our program in Bolivia. In essence, the goal of U.S. economic assistance is to move the Bolivian economy from one which depends on coca to one which is diversified, sustainable, and growing. The effectiveness of this strategy is contingent on the ability of law enforcement operations in the Chapari to keep the price of coca down. And this will permit the U.S. AID, uh, the Bolivian government, the United Nations and other donor countries to draw farmers away from coca production. We found that several improvements have resulted from projects funded by U.S. Uh, AID. Most hopefully, perhaps, the new alternative crops being grown in the Chapari now for both regional export and local market. But these are still only on the margin. A number of steps must be taken and or continued if the long-term development goal is to be met. These include identifying markets for selling crops other than coca, assisting farmers in their learning how to select, grow, and maintain these new crops, building adequate roads to transport crops to markets, and securing these roads 
so that they simply do not provide a more convenient means of illegally transporting coca, reducing current impediments to the export of Bolivian agricultural products to the United States, and delivering more realistic credit and other financial incentives to farmers, perhaps through some kind of mechanism such as we used in the states back in the 1930s of rural cooperatives, locally oriented rural cooperatives. We are pleased that both the U.S. and Bolivian governments are attempting to address many of these needs now. Among other steps being taken, I am delighted that legislation is being considered on the Hill under the Andean Trade Preference Act and the Enterprise for the Americas to help Bolivia and other drug producing nations in South America expand their exports to the United States. I find it incomprehensible that on one hand the government will spend considerable resources to wage the war against drugs and yet on the other hand effectively prevent these nations from exporting their alternative crops to the United States. Human rights was the last of the areas you uh, requested us to review. You asked that we focus on U.S. programs of military and law enforcement assistance to Bolivia to determine their impact on internationally recognized human rights. During our audit, we interviewed in Washington officials of such organizations as Amnesty International, America's Watch, Freedom House, the Washington Office on Latin America, and others. And in Bolivia, we interviewed a wide range of individuals, including journalists and academics. Based on these interviews and extensive research of files covering the past 11 years, we concluded that first, fewer abuses are committed in Bolivia than in the past. Second, Bolivia appears to have many, uh, much substantially fewer abuses than Peru and Colombia. And third, use of the Bolivian army in the counter-narcotics effort may potentially increase human rights abuses because the army has had a history of such problems in the past. In our interviews with the non-government people in Bolivia, we found that although many of their contacts had alleged human rights abuses, none of the individuals themselves had been recent victims of human rights abuses, nor could they provide any tangible evidence to support their claims. All incidents they described were based on second or third-hand information, such as newspaper articles or TV reports, uh, and nor do we receive from them the kind of documented evidence that would have enabled us to verify the allegations short of a major investigation that would have been outside the scope of our audit. The State Department has certified, and we think accurately, that Bolivia is not a gross violator of human rights. But we do find that the uh, embassy's procedures for identifying and reporting human rights abuses can be improved, and we made a number of recommendations toward that end. Lastly, administrative issues. In reviewing these, we found that the Embassy's Narcotic Affairs Section, the NAS, lacked adequate management controls over procurement, inventory, program assets, and petty cash and advance accounts. When anybody mentions internal controls or management controls, people's eyes glaze over. But the fact of the matter is that this is what makes uh, a program uh, secure against fraud and waste. We found, for example, that NAS had paid for, paid for six vehicles, only received three of them. And that was four years ago. We found that the lack of appropriate controls resulted in the reordering of nearly 15% of line items already in stock. And then we found that ammunition was being uh, stored in unsecured areas. We found that cash advances totaling over $100,000 to two Bolivian employees were in the process of being written off due to the failure to adequately supervise and establish proper controls. I have to also say, in fairness, that INM has reacted strongly to these uh, 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 complaints of ours, to these charges, and they have uh, significantly increased, increased the uh, efficacy of the work in, in Bolivia. But I cannot comment on what they've done. We hear that until we look at it again. We also believe that INM needs to pay more attention to overseas security and staffing. No recent threat assessment has been performed. Uh, and there was inadequate security at the NAS sub-office and other facilities, including the aircraft hangar, and that many U.S. personnel had not been given threat briefings, nor was the evacuation plan adequate. And we recommended that the Department's Bureau of Diplomatic Security conduct a threat assessment of facilities and U.S. facilities and operational areas. We found that the INM was giving relative inattention to overseas staffing and thus contributing to administrative weaknesses we identified. For example, the NAS director and a helicopter maintenance test pilot, two critical positions, were actually or effectively vacant for many months. And we made some recommendations toward this end. Mr. Chairman, 
in the front of my semi-annual reports each six months, I put a list of what I regard as the major problems in the Department of State. So nobody can come back afterward and say that uh, uh, we didn't uh, highlight these. Up until this issue, I always flagged international narcotics matters as a, uh, as a continuing problem, as a major continuing problem. I took it out in this current issue, which you'll be receiving shortly, basically because we found that the embassies were, in fact, becoming more aggressive, basically because INM was becoming more efficient in coordinating at the Washington level and passing guidance to the field, but mostly because, in sum, it's the host government and not the Department of State, which is the controlling factor. And any discussion of the drug problem and our attempt to control it must rest on the bedrock that it is not us, it ain't our country, it's somebody else's country. And therefore, we have to somehow persuade, cajole, and try to get that country to cooperate. And I felt that, in fairness, it would be inequitable if we were to keep gigging the Bureau in Washington for problems which reflected, in very large measure, uh, a lack of will of the host governments. So I took it out, but it doesn't mean I do not regard it as a problem, it still is. But I'm simply saying that we have to think of the problem in terms of the host government as well as ourselves. That concludes my statement, sir. Well, thank you both very much. <clears throat> but uh, even though it's the host government, uh, we're here today to analyze our part of the problem and, the, and how we resolve it. In no way am I taking us off the hook. And, and in that regard, I think the effectiveness of the Andean strategy uh, is pretty low. Uh, if we're stopping about 1% of the cocaine from Bolivia, there's no monitoring system for uh, how aid is used in uh, Colombia. The counter-narcotics programs in Peru uh, have not been effective. And uh, we find that there are seven, seven obstacles uh, noticed uh, here uh, by Mr. Conahan. Uh, the uh, ability to, of Peru to institute effective control over military and police to improve coordination and cooperation between per Peru's military and police to control the airports, to combat two insurgent groups, reduce corruption and human rights abuse, and decrease economic dependence on cocoa cultivation. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty critical evaluation of the Andean strategy uh, in Peru, isn't it? Yes, indeed, Mr. Chairman. I don't think that uh, the strategy uh, is working uh, in Peru. I don't think that the uh, program uh, has really gotten off the ground. And until those obstacles are over overcome, I don't see that we can begin an effective program in that country. Well, that's why I started my comments by saying that there is some question about the reality of the uh, anti-drug strategy. Uh, it comes out great on paper, it's very hard to execute. And uh, I don't mean to sit here in the calm of uh, the Rayburn building and wonder why things don't happen smoothly as planned, but it seems like we have more than just uh, a transition from theory to operation, that there are serious mistakes that are being made that are not being corrected. It seems also that there is a, a tendency to make things look good in the anti-drug war, especially in terms of uh, these drugs coming in, the uh, supply side, that really just keep us from ever getting any better from this strategy to click. Am I, am I being uh, overly critical of, of what you have put, put forward for us today? I think that... This is the first time I've heard the Rayburn Building called calm, sir. <laughs> well, 
Well, that's as compared to the Senate. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I think that for uh, any program of this import uh, to be successful, uh, it has to be uh, well thought out and planned. Uh, this program started out rather quickly. Uh, for example, in the case of Colombia, there was a quick infusion of uh, military assistance at the outset. Uh, we didn't have uh, people uh, on the ground in that country in order to effectively uh, accept and uh, implement uh, uh, that uh, assistance. I would have to, as Mr. Uh, Funk did, uh, give great credit to the people who were on the ground at that time. They worked long, hard, long and hard hours, and after a while were able to work that out. But there, it was very, very rocky to begin with. In the case of uh, Peru, uh, the obstacles that uh, we've reported to this committee this morning uh, in my view, uh, were not uh, uh, adequate, uh, or, or there was not an adequate strategy in order to work with the uh, Peruvian government to uh, overcome these. Certainly, uh, the administration and the various agencies involved are uh, acutely aware of these programs. Uh, they're working with the Peruvian government, or these problems. They're working with the Peruvian government in an effort to uh, overcome them. Uh, but based on uh, the work that we done, did this past summer, uh, they've got a long way to go. In terms of Bolivia, as you know, sir, I'm not reluctant to criticize, but I must also say that in Bolivia, the concentration which bothered me some years ago the, on, on statistics, on body counts to, to, to see where we're going, has considerably uh, died down. Uh, there was a conscious refocusing of effort in Bolivia on trying to deal with the vertically integrated syndicates. Now, it's much easier to make a quick hit on a small pace lab than it is to tackle some of these big syndicates. But the, uh, I have to say that the success has been marked. Now, has there been an absolute uh, increase in the amount of cocaine seized? No, there has not been. But there has been a disruption of the trafficking organizations. And this kind of refocusing of effort, I think over the long term, is going to pay substantial dividends. But I have to also say there's a subject we haven't touched on which does cause me some concern. And that is the balloon effect, the, uh, the spillover effect. One of the ironies is that the more successful we are in any one of the Andean countries, the more successful we are in interdicting, we push the processing or we push the traffic over across the border. That's very much the case now in Brazil, which in the Rondonia section, in the Mato Grosso do Sul section, is now experiencing substantial corruption, which was not there before, substantial amounts of trafficking, and there's evidence that uh, uh, while I was in Brazil uh, during the summer, the newspapers were full of major drug busts. 650 kilos were seized in Fortaleza, which is not, has not been a normal trafficking area. And I am concerned that the concentration of the Andean strategy on these three major countries is not accompanied by an equivalent concern, or at least a substantial concern, for the so-called Tier 2 countries of uh, Brazil, Ecuador, Venezuela, Paraguay, Argentina. Increasingly, these countries are going to be caught up. And as they're going to be caught up, we're going to have to put more and more assistance in, in some form or another. And that's going to take dollars. Do you have studies ongoing as to this uh, so-called balloon effect of what's happening uh, as uh, relative success in increases in these three countries uh, what's happening in Brazil, Brazil and there's, there's nearby? There's substantial evidence in, Boliv in Bolivia that the traffickers are moving across the rivers into the uh, Mato Grosso, Rondonia areas. And of course, the Brazilian government itself is now becoming uh, very much aware of the problem. Uh, Mr. Levitsky was down recently uh, speaking to the senior officials of the, of the government. There's substantial amount of information, which I can't discuss in an open hearing, on uh, the nature of the traffic, uh, and it's growing sharply. And, and Brazil, in some ways, is a much more difficult country, much more massive, much more complex, much more sophisticated than, uh, uh, than Bolivia. Mr. Chairman. Do you notice a balloon effect, uh, too, Yes, Mr. indeed, uh, Mr. Chairman. And as a matter of fact, uh, we are doing an examination at the request of this committee's counterpart on the Senate. Uh, the field work has been completed. Uh, we are analyzing the data, and we expect to render a report to that uh, committee right after the first of the year. Well, now, in uh, the GAO report, uh, 
We have a, a problem with the implementation plan of the Andean strategy. It's observed that it's too broad and general to measure performance and that there should be useful performance criteria that includes indicators of changes in production and shipment of cocaine. Uh, you talked about uh, the lack of uh, specific time frames and quantitative goals and that uh, the statistics are frankly of limited usefulness. Uh, the, the information about the cocaine seized and labs destroyed don't really always indicate a pattern of activity or the impact on the flow of drugs. Can you tell us how serious this problem is in terms of uh, measuring the effectiveness of the Andean strategy? We're spending $2.2 billion in this program. I don't believe that you can have a full measure of the effectiveness of the program in the absence of that kind of data. I think uh, that uh, you can get indications of progress. For example, in the Peruvian situation, the seven ob obstacles that you mentioned a moment ago, if we see that those obstacles are being overcome, that's some indication of movement. But until you get good information on <clears throat> reductions in the production and uh, movement of uh, this, uh, you're not going to get uh, a true measure of effectiveness. Uh, we've been discussing this with, uh, with the Department of State. Uh, we understand that uh, they are trying to come up with uh, these measures of effectiveness to determine the kind of criteria that they will use to do that. Uh, we haven't seen it. The difficulty with some of the other indicators that you mentioned, for example, the number of arrests, the one thing that you don't know, <clears throat> you can come up with a number of arrests, but you don't know, you know what happened to the individual after he was arrested, or indeed whether you have the right person. Uh, and, and so those secondary and tertiary kinds of indicators are, are not really good for this, this purpose. We were told frequently that one reason for DEA being so essential, and of course they are, they're on the cutting edge of the whole operation, is that we are after prosecutions, arrests, of prosecutions and sentencing. We asked DEA to give us some data on that, on what percentage of the cases result in prosecutions, and do they have any information on disposition after prosecution? Was there actual jail time served? Were there actual uh, reimbursements, uh, fines, things like that? DEA came back and said they simply don't have that information, that the situation in the, the judicial system in um, Bolivia simply doesn't track this information, and they can't get it. So here again, we're, we're uh, sort of puzzled by, by dealing with the database, which is uh, uh, absent. And we're trying to come up with uh, decisions based on data, which is e either not there or is questionable. Well, it, it, it makes it uh, difficult for us to have an effective uh, evaluation of our strategy. And I guess it gets back to your point. It may not, it may not be our fault that they don't keep the right stats. But it's our fault that we cover it up and keep glossing it over and keep giving these reports and giving you people in the field that are doing the evaluations for the Congress a hard time. That doesn't help anything. Uh, we've, we've got the most uh, uh, unusual preface I've ever seen to, uh, to a report of, a file by an IG in which uh, you have to defend yourself against the attacks uh, made on you out in the field, Mr. Funk. Uh, you, uh, you, don't, you don't do that too often, do you? No, this is the first time I've ever done that in my entire career as an IG. Well, it's the kind of administration hardball that shows that they don't want anybody messing around out here evaluating these systems. And uh, I think it's a part of the Congress to make sure that we know uh, when these kinds of accusations and charges are being made. Uh, it means that they don't want us to know and they don't want the American people to know. So where did these charges come from? Oh, they came from the embassy. Uh, but I, I, I think, again, I, I want to be honest and say that they were complaining not about our facts because they didn't take issue with uh, a great many of the facts. They thought that the team had arrived with a predisposition what the findings were going to be. Uh, and therefore, they took issue with what they regard as the objectivity of our review. Yeah, uh, but that, that, uh, that kind of prejudicial 
conclusions in advance uh, make inspector generals irrelevant. If everybody uh, said, we, we know you're coming out to do a job on us, uh, what, what they know is that you're going to be hard and fair and let the, the facts fall where they may. That's what, we that's what they were objecting to. They sure don't like this report, I don't believe, uh, now that you filed it. No, I would say that's a fair statement, sir. So, I, I mean, I think that we've got to talk about the independence of uh, the operation of the inspectors general, or we're going to just uh, find out that they get intimidated, run off the place, or accused of being prejudiced in advance. And I don't think you need to have to work under that environment. It's tough and dangerous enough as it is without being hassled by those within the organization that you're designed to oversight. I must say that the, uh, I have never had that problem before. Uh, it's not a major problem now, it's just this one specific audit. I've received uh, very open and full support from Mr. Baker, Mr. Eagleberger, and before that, Mr. Schultz. I've had no question about my independence state. Did you get any cooperation from uh, former Ambassador Gelbert? Well, he was intimately involved uh, with, the, uh, with the audit while it was going on. Uh, he, uh, he, he certainly uh, gave us the information that we wanted, certainly. What about GAO, uh, Mr. Comptroller? What, what, hap what, what are you guys getting from State Department on this? A lot of gas? Well, with, with one exception in the instant case, uh, which I'd like to uh, comment on, uh, we received uh, good cooperation both at the field level and, uh, and here in Washington. But as you know, Mr. Chairman, uh, in other uh, reviews and examinations, we've run into uh, similar kinds of situations as was described by Mr. Funk. But let me tell you about the one, uh, the one exception here. Uh, we provided uh, all of the agencies involved with an opportunity to comment on our findings and conclusions. Indeed, because both initial drafts of our reports on Colombia and Peru were classified, we had to submit them to the agencies uh, uh, for security review. Uh, all agencies except the Department of State uh, did provide substantive comment on our findings and conclusions. Uh, the Department of State uh, took the position that uh, because we didn't formally submit it to them, that they weren't going to uh, provide uh, comments to it. I raise that because it will be interesting to see what the State Department witnesses have to say about our report today uh, when they really had an opportunity earlier to uh, comment on it so that we could an analyze their comment and then respond to it. And also incorporate any changes that might be necessary in your report. Absolutely, yes. Sir. So you'll be hearing for the first time what, what uh, they've got to say about the report. From the Department of State, yes. Okay, let me close. If I my may, Mr. Chairman, I'll just make one additional point. <clears throat> Part of the difficulty I suspect that I've had with the uh, post in this case is that the Department of State does not really understand the audit processes yet because until our shop was formed uh, four years ago, uh, there was not an aggressive internal audit program in state. Uh, they're accustomed to inspectors, they're accustomed to investigators, but audit process is still very difficult for them to grasp. And the fact that we keep giving drafts of comments, uh, ask them to comment on it and come back and we keep changing it in response to their comments uh, uh, is widely misinterpreted. And I think that the problem is much a sheer lack of understanding by some elements in the department uh, than it is any attempt to subvert the independence of the IG. I don't think that's the issue. Well, I want to tell you that this committee is going to back up these two parts of the Congress. Uh, they started. Uh, they both started out a government operation, so I think we're operating out of a, of a tradition. Uh, the GAO is the investigative arm of the Congress. The inspector generals do the job inside uh, in, in all the departments and agencies, and they're recently uh, acquiring even more expertise and, and are being increasingly relied on. And it seems to me that uh, we've got to know about these kinds of problems. Uh, I'm, I'm disturbed with the State Department. I hope I don't show it because I want to treat them real, real nice when they come up here. 
But when an assistant secretary that I call on the phone named Mr. Bernard Aronson tells me he never heard about the fact he was supposed to testify this morning, and yet he's got a letter dated October 10th from me uh, that he didn't realize that they got scrubbed last night at 8 o'clock and he knows nothing about it. Uh, I think that that's a, I think I get the message. And I'm going to get a message back to him. Now let me just close down my part of this, and I've, I've gone longer than I intended. But I've got to ask uh, you, Mr. Conahan, about the, uh, the, the United States base uh, uh, in the upper Huaga Valley in uh, Peru and, uh, and find out what kind of security we've got there for our people that are up there. Mr. Chairman, we are going to uh, provide you a separate uh, classified report uh, on that matter. And I think that's about as far as uh, I can go on that at the moment. All right. Let me uh, ask uh, Mr. Funk, uh, and we, uh, we're in an open session, but do you have any recommendations that you can bring to this discussion about the shortcomings in the intelligence area that the United States is uh, is, is doing in Pol Bolivia? Not fully in an open session, sir. I uh, propose, and I'm going to pursue it, that my colleagues uh, in the Defense Department uh, and in the uh, Justice Department and in the uh, uh, CIA uh, conduct a joint review of this area. Uh, that has not been uh, on the table very long and I really can't discuss what will happen to it. I believe that this area of intelligence coordination would benefit by having this kind of joint review by the four IGs involved. And well, I, I appreciate that. that. It sounds like we're going to have to have a closed session for both of you uh, so that uh, this subcommittee can go more fully into these matters. I uh, thank you for your indulgence, and I recognize Mr. Frank Horton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> As I understand it, uh, Mr. Conahan, uh, the um, Ge General Accounting Office uh, studies were uh, primarily in Colombia and Peru. You did not uh, study the Bolivian situation, or did you? No, that is correct. And was that an agreement that you made with State uh, IG? Uh, and with this committee. Yeah, so that you covered two of the nations. and. Um, um, Mr. Funk or the IG uh, covered the other, and so, so in, in general, you were working together covering the, the, the three countries. Is that correct? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, we, we saw what their audit program was, they saw what our audit program was, and we... Were, were your programs uh, fairly identical with regard to um, uh, the methods and procedures and processes? I think that uh, the uh, state program uh, was much more detailed in terms of uh, looking at the, uh, the, the management issues, the, administration, the administrative issues, uh, than was ours. Uh, we looked at uh, the uh, conditions that existed uh, in, in the countries that needed to be tended to. Uh, we looked at the uh, mechanisms uh, that were or were not in place for planning for monitoring and for making assessments uh, of the programs in those countries. Uh, some commonalities had to do with, uh, with human uh, rights considerations. And it's kind of interesting, we both came out in the same place. Rather than trying to go on out and do our own work in that area, we had to rely on uh, work that had already been done. Now, what was the scope of your uh, studies? Uh, what, what, what was the goals? What were you looking at? Uh, what uh, items were you looking at? Uh, I think simply put, it was the status of uh, the programs uh, in the two countries as well as uh, the uh, management and uh, effectiveness of the programs to date. And was that uh, also your, your uh, um, uh, situation, Mr. Funk, with regard to your studies? We looked at the, in addition to the points that uh, Mr. Conahan and the GIA uh, looked at, uh, we, as, as he mentioned, we, we did get into the management of the program in some detail. Uh, the following up on work we've done earlier. We also looked at the coordination in Washington, the coordination in the field, and we looked in some detail at the law enforcement, the military assistance, human rights, and economic. We spent quite a bit of time on the economic uh, area. Overall, what is your assessment of the management uh, problems? 
in, in the country that you looked at? In the case of Bolivia, considerably better than it had been in the past. Considerably better, but still well, now, a long what, way. What did you compare it with? Uh, a study that you had made earlier, or, or just? Yes, sir. Uh, we we uh, we audited the program back in 1988, so we have some uh, baseline to work from. So you found improvement. Yes, sir. In, in the overall management. Sharp what, improvement. What uh, what was that last? A sharp improvement. Sharp improvement. Yes, sir. Um, did you actually go in uh, um, in country? I mean, did, did you actually go out in the field? Yes, sir. The team went uh, to uh, Chapari, to Cochabamba, Santa Cruz, Trinidad, uh, as well as the embassy. I was there myself a year ago, uh, both to Peru and into Bolivia, uh, and I spent some time in Peru. I also discussed the the corruption question with the then Prime Minister, Hurtado Mila, uh, with, together with the ambassador in Peru. It was quite the most surreal conversation I've ever had with anybody. Uh, his, injun his injunction from uh, the President Fujimori was to moralize Peru. And that was a time when the Chief of Staff of the Peruvian Army was being paid $350 a month. And uh, I, I felt quite like it was an Alice in Wonderland situation. Uh, in Bolivia, I also went to the uh, Chapari, uh, which is the base of the operational work, uh, Santa Cruz, Trinidad, and Cochabamba. Looked at the riverine work. So then my, my staff had been there. Mr. Meenan, sitting in back here, had led the uh, audit back in 1988. So we have an extensive experience there, before and after. Well, did you find cooperation with the host company and in, in your uh, host country in your um, uh, study of the situation? Much better, much better now, Mr. Horton, than it was then. Much better. The and embassy was very, very aggressive in, uh, for example, when, for example, I mentioned in my testimony, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, program of giving money, $2,000 for every hectare uh, eliminated. Uh, for a while, that money dried up, and the farmers are not being paid. Uh, and that would have re reduced the program to an absurdity. And uh, the ambassador just really ripped in and corrected the problem in very short order. Did you find uh, cooperation from the... Um, um American personnel in the um, in the host country, uh, including the ambassador, or did did you find uh, difficulties? We found that at the embassy I'm level. I'm talking now about cooperation. Cooperation with the audit, you mean? Or yes. The, oh yes. Sometimes not very happy cooperation, but yes, cooperation. Well, I think I think we have to understand. Uh, of course, the General Accounting Office has been in existence for a number of years. Uh, and it's pretty well established it's an arm of the Congress. Uh, the IGs, um, and I was one of the principal authors of those yes, sir, of that know. legislation, as you know. And um, it, it was a concept that was not well accepted. Um, we put one, the first one was in HEW. And then subsequent to that, we put a number um, in, I think it was something like 12 or 13 departments. And then um, um, the most difficult, I guess, were state and uh, justice and treasury. Uh, there was ex there was resistance. Uh, matter of fact, we've had resistance all down the line. The Department of Defense resisted, uh, and so did state. And, and I know, I understand, and um, I think that's what the chairman was trying to get to. And uh, you, I think, um, were very nice in the way way you put it that uh, they're not familiar with the process yet. Um, I would hope that they're going to get familiar with it because you're going to be there or the IG is going to be there for some period of time. It's not going to, we're not going to let you dry up and blow away. Mr. Horton, the oldest civilian IG is in the State Department. Uh, President Teddy Roosevelt directed the Secretary of State, then John Hay, to establish an inspection program in 1906. So we've had an ongoing inspection program in state since then. In 1957, the but that's not like the IG. No, it was, the IG job was created in 57, but it was essentially still an inspection operation rather than an, uh, uh, an audit and investigation and inspection. I still do inspections now, of course. But there's a sizable difference between the inspection uh, of a post and an audit of a function on that post. And that uh, difference is not readily understood yet. Well, now... I'm hoping to make it very apparent, though. Uh, you classify it as misunderstanding or lack of understanding. Uh, you don't, you don't find resistance, or do you? <laughs> not really. Honestly, not really, sir. Mm. They may disagree, but uh, if we have an investigation, uh, if we have a recommendation that I believe is sustainable, I fight it till, till the cows come home. 
and well, I'll now, take it all the um, way up. With regard to the overall study that you made of Bolivia, um, how do you classify the uh, situation today? Um, uh, do, do you find great progress has been made? Do you feel that we're on the right track? Uh, what are we lacking? Um, why isn't it being more effective, or is it uh, effective? When I was in the Chapari last year, I was having a, a cup of coffee with the chief, the agent in charge of the DEA operation, a very able man. And he pleaded with me to come back to the States and try to persuade everybody that not to expect a quick fix. They were starting from ground zero at that time. And he said it's going to take an awful lot of years before we have a successful program. Uh, that's true. It is going to take years. It's not going to happen overnight. I think there has been progress. I think that in the case of the Chapari, the big traffickers have been booted out of it, which is why now we're getting mostly small pace labs rather than uh, big processing centers. Uh, but success, ironically, brings its own difficulties, such as the spillover effect into neighboring countries. Uh, and also, the basic and most important aspect of it is just now getting underway. And that's the economic assistance. Because when, uh, when all is said and done, Unless the economy and the society can sustain a counter-narcotics program, all the busting in the world, all the arrests in the world are not going to make a difference. We need both. And the fact is that the economic assistance, Mr. Horton, is just now getting off the ground. So, so it's too early to make a So we've got a long way to call. go, in other words, uh, still. Say again? We have a long way to go. Yes, sir. We do indeed. Uh, have you made recommendations with regard to what uh, additional um, uh, things should be done as far as the uh, drug program is concerned? Yes, sir. We've submitted a whole list of recommendations to the various agencies involved. And are they following up on that? Most of them have been agreed with. A few are contentious. Now, um, Mr. Conahan, without going through each one of uh, those questions just like I asked, could, could you just in general comment and give your answers basically with regard to the two countries that you looked at, generally in, in line with what I'd ask uh, Mr. Funk? In the case of uh, Peru, uh, the program is in such an early stage that uh, I don't think that uh, anyone is in a position to talk about uh, uh, achievement. Uh, the, the, it just simply isn't there uh, yet uh, in, in that country. Now, in the case of uh, Colombia, uh, the Colombians have been taking uh, aggressive uh, action uh, with the uh, assistance provided by the United States. Uh, they have made substantial hits on uh, one uh, major uh, group uh, in country. Uh, it seems that uh, another group is kind of picking up where uh, that, country, uh, th that group uh, left off, so that, that you've, you've got a real problem. I don't know quite how to measure that yet. As I said, in both uh, cases, uh, we uh, lack a, a measurement system, and I think that that is uh, necessary before anyone can come to the kind of conclusion that you're looking for. Uh, are you still um, involved in, um, in pursuing the, the studies of these two countries? In other words, do you have a follow-up plan? We uh, completed uh, the work for purposes of uh, today's hearing, but we're going to go back in to do a much more detailed study in both countries. As a matter of fact, it will get closer to some of the things that uh, Mr. Funk talked about in the country that he covered. And how about you, Mr. Funk? Is that uh, true also? Uh, you're still we have a normal uh, audit follow-up process. We, we issue an order. We don't simply throw it out and let it stay there by itself. We do follow up and we'll do some follow-up here. My next major audit though is going to, in the drug area will be on, in Southeast Asia in the Golden Triangle area oriented toward heroin. Well, that now, will be the next major uh, drug audit. Another thing we did uh, last in the last Congress we uh, created these chief financial officers and uh, they're supposed to be in place um, in the, in yes, the various sir. agencies. Uh, is there one in the um, State Department? We State do indeed. Department. Pardon? We do have a, uh, she was confirmed and she's operating right now. And, uh, and that's going to, and they're going to be looking at these management problems. Um, how about you, Mr. Conahan, and the two countries you were involved with? What about the management situation there? Again, I think that uh, you know, there, there, there are two levels of management, I guess. There's a day-to-day a -day put out the fire kind of management, and then there is the big picture management where you've got to get in place systems in order to make that management work. Right. Uh, in the case of um, uh, Colombia, 
they were uh, uh, very, very late in coming up with planning for the military assistance. And as a matter of fact, at the moment, there is not an approved plan for the military assistance. In both countries, uh, there is not a system in place to uh, monitor uh, the uh, military assistance. Now, in the case of Colombia, uh, I think that's very important because large amounts of assistance are going into that country. You might say it's not so important in Peru since the assistance has not yet begun to arrive. But it's kind of interesting. They were directed to come up with such a system, uh, and they have not done so. And then finally, in terms of, of the measurement system that we've already talked about, it's not there. In terms of managing on a day-to-day -day basis, they seem to be doing as, as best they can. Now, <clears throat> there are different um, uh, strategies, and, and the countries are entirely different. Each one of these three countries is quite different. Uh, do the strategies take into account that difference, and uh, do they try to adapt to the differences uh, that uh, each country has in order to try to be more effective? Can I think back on that? Uh, we've got an insurgency problem in Peru, so you've got a, at least a rationale for the army intervening there. Bolivia, you don't have that, and, and we still get reports that, that we're countenancing the use of the army there. Colombia is export, financial, money laundering. Uh, they're uh, in the, the finishing processes of the drug trade. And, and I think Frank Horton's put his finger on it. What's, does this Andean strategy take that into consideration sufficiently to make these things work? I think that uh, in the case of uh, Colombia, certainly Peru, uh, insurgents are uh, involved in drug-related activity. And I think it's proper, therefore, that uh, U.S. assistance uh, be made available uh, to uh, counter that kind of activity. I think that we have to have the mechanisms in place to assure that uh, the assistance is not being provided uh, to counter uh, insurgency activity uh, uh, solely. But uh, otherwise, I, I think it's quite appropriate. And I do think we have a different situation in, uh, in Bolivia. And uh, I don't know whether Mr. Funk has, has previously commented on that. In, in light of what there, these questions There is are. no organized narco-terrorism the way we have in Peru and, and Colombia. Nor do we have, more important, we don't have any major insurgency, political insurgency, a politically directed insurgency, such as the Sendero Luminoso and the MRTA in Peru. Uh, Bolivia is not really a violent country. It hasn't been until quite recently. So there's a different ball game, totally. Now, if you ask whether there's flexibility in the Andean strategy to accommodate these differences, on paper, certainly there is. And the, uh, we were told by all the people involved that, yes, we do have sufficient flexibility to react differently to different situations. But in de facto, as opposed to the, uh, 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 I want to put it in, in theory, de facto, uh, I'm not sure that flexibility exists. Well. I think that what, what I'm interested in, and I think the chairman is too, um, you, you're doing separate studies and audits and that sort of thing, and you're looking at the management problems. But there, there is a drug uh, czar, and there's an office of, uh, for the drug uh, program, and then the various departments, the Department of Defense, and in your case, the Department of State, has the overall supervision of this, uh, of this uh, 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 strategy, and I think that what we need to do is look at look at the overall direction of the strategy as it relates to the State Department, and uh, determine whether or not it's being effective uh, in each of those countries with regard to the um, to the mission of eliminating the um, the, the drugs from, from those from those countries. Uh, so, in, in a way, uh, Mr. Funk, you're looking at the overall. From, from the top, uh, from the State Department, uh, which is, I think, what Mr. Conahan was talking about before, too. The management at the top level is, is just as important, I guess, as it, as it is in country, so to speak. And the question uh, that I have is, what about that management at the top level? Well, Mr. Horton, the difficulty is that success in the drug business is in the eye of the beholder. It's very difficult to find any cohesive, coherent measures that will determine whether something's successful or not. Uh, ultimately, the only way we have it is there a decreased flow of drugs into the United States. 
Uh, certainly has been in a sharp upsurge into Europe. I might add, I'm a little bit, uh, uh, I, I do think it would be appropriate for us to get some more money or get some money from Europe. Because after all, they, those countries are now experiencing some severe drug problems. And I believe they should bear their share of the containment problem. that problems. comes out of this area too. Yeah. But in terms of the, uh, of the management of it, uh, until we have a clear indication of what we're trying to achieve, we know what the goal is, which broadly stated, to reduce, decrease the flow of drugs. But there has to be, to measure it, some kind of sublevels. And I would be bitterly opposed to going into all these body counts we had of so many hectares eliminated, so many busts, so many extraditions and so forth, because those are all uh, 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 subject to wide interpretation, and you can have a thousand arrests and not really get at the heart of the problem. So we lack right now uh, a good measure of how to determine when we have victory. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Unless we adopt the senator from Vermont's uh, theory, just declare victory and get out, you know, but we can't do that. No. Thank you, uh, Mr. Frank Horton. Mr. Glenn English. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, Mr. Funk, the point that I was making earlier, I want to hit this very quickly. I don't want to make a big deal. I think you, you gave us a fine statement, and uh, uh, I think you made a lot of sense in, in the points you're making. But one is our own Department of Agriculture can't tell us what crop production is in this country, so I would suggest trying to uh, use similar, uh, similar uh, means to determine what uh, the production of any uh, of coca or anything else uh, would be uh, risky at best. Yeah. Second is an awful lot of that crop is going to Europe these days and, uh, and elsewhere around the world as opposed to coming here. I get very, very nervous when I start hearing people throwing around percentages about what we get interdicted or what we do anything else with. I'm uh, reminded of the story of, of one of the first uh, DEA, uh, heads of DEA, and he came before one of the congressional committees and he was pressed very hard, well, how many, how many, how much do we get? And he came back with a figure 10 percent. And I've heard the figure 10 percent uh, bandied around, I guess, for the last uh, 15 years. And he was asked by his age afterwards, where'd you come up with 15%? He said, well, I knew we were getting some, but not a lot, and 10% sounded about right. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I, that, I get very nervous when people raise any percentages. I jump in and I, I didn't I do mean also, to make that big a deal at it, but I'm, I get nervous about that. The, uh, the issue I raised earlier, uh, the question of heroin, I understand we're getting into the heroin production down in that part of the world and that uh, we're using uh, uh, the system that has been delivering cocaine in this country. We've got heroin moving this way. And uh, we're finding here within the United States now, uh, this is the new, uh, the new fad, is combining heroin and cocaine. So we're getting what is a very, a very lethal mix there from a, a, a drug standpoint. And, and obviously it uh, contains big dangers for the future of this country. Um, uh, but I've heard you mentioned heroin one time. I see these charts we've got up around. I don't see heroin written on any of them. Uh, what, uh, what's taking place in that part of the world with regard to heroin, uh, both Mr. Conahan and Mr. Funk? It, I'm not aware of any significant heroin production at all coming from uh, South America. It's my understanding. I'm not aware of any significant heroin production at all coming from uh, South America. It's my understanding now, that they're possibly. getting into, uh, getting into the, the heroin business down in, in the that In the Central American world. area and maybe the northern shore, uh, perhaps in Belize, an area like that, but not in the Andean countries. Mr. Conahan, have you uh, come across any, anything along those lines? Uh, only uh, uh, anecdotal information as we went through uh, our work. We haven't done any examination of our own on that. But you have come across uh, reports of uh, increased heroin activity? In, in Colombia. In Colombia. Yes, sir. And um, uh, that uh, is mainly the cartels uh, in that area are moving into the heroin production. Again, uh, this is uh, second-hand, uh, unverified, and unvalidated information okay. on our part. I'll be happy to yield to With respect to the heroin, which is an important point you're bringing up, uh, the Colombian National Police, I might add, were surprised to find 925 hectares of the poppy growing in Colombia. That's what uh, I understood, that that may be uh, where the, the direction the cartel is moving in. And I'm very disturbed, as I mentioned. Uh, these reports have, uh, have come out and evidently gone to uh, the drug czar, and uh, it's my understanding he is prohibited this kind of uh, information being distributed to the public. So I'm very uh, concerned about that and something that we want to look at much closer. Uh, Mr. Funk uh, uh, and Mr. Conahan, with regard to this strategy, uh, I guess the question I'd like to raise with regard to, uh, to this uh, 
to the entire strategy we have down there, I think, uh, Mr. Conahan, you made the point that this is something that was slapped together pretty quick, uh, implemented very quickly, uh, not a great deal of thought and planning uh, when it was uh, put together. Um, the one thing I, that I keep coming back to, Mr. Funk hit this point, was this issue of the fact that it's the host government that has got to accept this program. Uh, and he has removed uh, this from being a principal concern in his report because he feels like our people, our embassies, our efforts down there, we're making a pretty good effort. And But then on the other hand, if it's going to succeed, we've got to have the host government being actively involved. I want to be a recipient, want to make it work. And then we're hearing all these reports, Mr. Conahan, from you and others about corruption and problems and all this, that, and the other. And it doesn't really seem to me making a whole lot of difference. And then I believe, Mr. Funk, you also made the point with regard to Bolivia that their income off of COCA is twice the next most important item within their economy. The question comes down if your economy is going to collapse, if this program is successful. And, uh, and certainly in that part of the world, the, the overall economic conditions has a great deal to do with the stability of your government. Is it, uh, if, you, if you're a leader of one of those countries, if you're in government in one of those countries, are you looking uh, at, uh, at the real possibility that uh, you're going to be, that your government is going to in effect be committing suicide if you, uh, in fact, uh, take this program seriously and try to implement it within your country? If we're talking about somebody waving a magic wand and eradicating coca overnight, that would be true. Uh, but obviously, the hope and expectations are that the, there would be a concurrent decrease in coca and a correlating increase in other crops. And there are, in fact, other crops being grown now in the Chaperi in Bolivia. Okay, well, I, I'd like to take that point up. Um, you know, and, and as I said, I'm, I'm playing a little devil's advocate here because I'm very concerned. I think there's an Achilles heel with this Andrean strategy, Andrean strategy, I think, and that's what's bothering me about this, and it's bothered me about this program all along. You know, we can't, we're having trouble even providing a, our own farmers to stay in business. Here in the United States, we've had in the last decade, you know, we've had thousands upon thousands of farmers have gone out of business because they couldn't make a living. And now we're going down there and say, hey, you know, why don't you grow some wheat, or why don't you grow some soybeans, or why don't you grow some other crop which has broke American farmers? That doesn't make much sense, does it? Not unless there's a strong inducement that can be offered to do that. You're going to have to have a big subsidy. So we've got in the effect. United States government, which in effect is going to allow our own farmers to go broke or run them out of business, however you want to look at it, where you're cutting I think the agriculture led the cuts with regard to the budget reconciliation package last year, and we're going to take that money and give it to farmers in Peru and Bolivia and that part of the world in order to keep them from growing coke. But the that rationale the for that, I'm sorry. Is that the exchange we're making? I would not suggest that. I would say that the rationale, if there be one, has to be the fact that the effect of large scale, the effect of massive introduction of hard drugs into the United States is so debilitating to our society that we have to pay a price to get rid of it. And that price may very well be that kind of uh, uh, correlation you're talking about. I understand that and, I, and I, you know, I don't disagree if we could do it. But you also then made the point, and I think it's a very valid point, of the spillover, this ballooning. So we buy off the farmers in uh, Bolivia, but then we've got to go buy them off in Brazil. Is that right? Well, it won't be the farmers. It will be the traffickers. Brazil is not a major source country as yet. Doesn't well, it, to be. It, it will be, though, if we buy everybody off in Peru and Bolivia. Where else are you going to go? Then you've got to go to Brazil, don't you? That would be a uh, I mean, you're not going to buy off the trafficker, are you? It would be very difficult. Yeah. Yeah, they, that's pretty big bucks to buy those guys out. I, they've got more money than we got deficit. That they, could, they can buy out us. I just they think. can buy us out, right. That's probably a pretty good point. Yeah. So, in effect, what you've done in order to make this strategy work, if you carry it through, and should it be successful if we go year after year after year, in effect, we're going to have to buy out all the farmers in South America. No, no because if, you, if the strategy works, that's a big if. 
if the strategy works, we will make it so difficult for people to make money out of drugs by seizing enough, by arresting enough, by causing enough discombobulation to the uh, traffic flow that it will no longer be uh, profitable for people to take that gamble of uh, trafficking in drugs. That's a big if, I admit. Oh, I don't want to get into anything that's a little classified here, but let me hit another point and I'll try to hit this without getting into any details, and I'm sure that you or Mr. Conahan probably or both of you are aware of it. We're also finding, though, when we start increasing arrest in some of these countries, eh, things get pretty squeamish in a hurry. I mean, you're arresting the wrong folks, and they got connections. And if they got connections, then we find that the government said, well, you can go confiscate this stuff, but don't arrest anybody. Don't we run into a little of that kind of business? Yes, sir. It's kind of hard then to make it stick that we're going to arrest them. Well, that's why I said at the very beginning. Successful. And it's kind of hard to say, well, we're going to bow to farmers because got, they got more farmers than we got money. I could say we're already breaking our own farms. Can't even take care of our own rather than go down there and buy out their farms. So Mr. that kind of raises questions, doesn't it? Mr. English, the point I made at the very beginning of my testimony is that the political will of these governments is of paramount importance. Lacking that, nothing else will happen. Okay. I think, and I think, Mr. Gonahan, do you, do you agree with that? Oh, I, I fully agree with it. Uh, we talked uh, earlier about the uh, obstacles in Peru to uh, making this strategy work. And there are two that are kind of interesting as I think about it here. First, in uh, gaining control over both the uh, military and, and the police organizations. It kind of goes to who gets prosecuted a little bit, the conversation you just had right here. Uh, the president uh, did announce that uh, he created such a, an institution, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's got no budget. It exists only on paper. There, there is no control there uh, at the moment. Another rather interesting area is in control over airports, and I just took a page from uh, our report. Peru has got 356 registered and an estimated 40 unregistered airports, of which 58 are controlled by the Civilian Aeronautics Agency and 9 by the military. The remaining airports generally under private ownership uh, are not controlled at all. And uh, until you, you get some sort of control over, over the air uh, ports down there, uh, you're not making a, a very big step in, in the area of uh, what we're trying to do here. What Mr. Funk has found then is that our people who are involved in this strategy, who are involved in trying to make this strategy go, say, well, it's not going to be a quick fix, I think, as, as was pointed out, but somewhere down the years. And I think Mr. Funk, the best he could do is going to be years and years before it comes down. The question comes down is, you know, will this administration, not this U.S. administration, but this administration in Colombia, this administration in Bolivia, this administration in Peru, if in effect it's political suicide for them to participate actively in making certain that this strategy works because it destroys their very economy, which destroys their very government, you know, why would it be even any more sound than for their successor to take that action? Or his successor, or his successor. The point that I'm, I'm making is that we can't buy out the farmers. Politically, we're not going to be, re going to be arresting the, the important people, evidently, that would discourage them from the arrest standpoint. And, and in order to get the participation of those governments, they've got to, to in effect, wipe themselves out. They're in, you're asking them to wipe themselves out. The question is, isn't this a fatal flaw in this whole strategy? Isn't this a strategy that, in effect, cannot work? I think it's a very uh, difficult uh, and complex uh, question that you raise in the first instance, and therefore uh, the strategy uh, is is difficult one to uh, formulate. But I think we can't lose sight of the fact that there is some progress, and uh, well, we can't... What is progress? Well, you told me you couldn't measure progress. Well, you, can, you can't measure it. Well, if you uh, can't it, measure it, then how can you tell me well, you got I progress? Well, I think there, I think there are indicators. I think indicators. The, I think the fact that uh, the Colombian government is much more aggressive than it had been in the past, uh, that they are indeed uh, making a, a number of hits, is 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 an indicator that that government is willing to do some things. What kind of there. hits are the now, Colombian government making? They they have uh, uh, made interceptions. They have made seizures. Uh, they have made uh, some arrests. Uh, 
uh, m more so than they had in the past. Now, is that cutting down on the flow of uh, drugs out of that country? No, I, I can't answer that question. And th that's where you want to go. I can't go there with you. Well, I'm saying that there's. I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm even going further than that because I'm going to say, well, how, how far is it over there to Venezuela and Brazil? I quite agree with that. So yeah. you just kind of go across the border if, he no, gets to, if you're really getting effective. Evidently, they're not even that effective because they haven't driven them out that, to that extent. And, I, we're, and we're in now to the, to, to the point that we're producing heroin in Colombia. Sounds to me like it's going the other direction. We didn't have that much, we didn't have that much coca production in, in uh, Colombia. Now we're into the heroin production business. I am not in any way able to comment on the effectiveness of the program, nor do I think uh, are they because of the absence of, of, of uh, measurement mechanism. My point only point is I don't think it would be fair for me to sit here and say that we didn't see some movement on the part of the governments down there. Well, you see a little movement. Okay, well, let me ask you, what we're spending, $2 billion? So what like we're spending in the long run here? 2.2. 2.2 billion dollar program we got here going. Conahan, you, uh, I know GAO has done studies and, and looked at, uh, at all these various programs in the war on drugs. If you took $2.2 billion and, say, put it into drug education in this country, where, I, are we I, gonna get the, where are we going to get the bigger bang for the buck? Well, I'm not prepared to answer that question, but I do think that unless we look at the demand side, you know, we're not going to make this thing work just by looking at the supply side. All right, side. and we've got a program going here with it, which isn't working, right? The best, Mr. Funk tells, is going to be years and years and years and years and years. Maybe you'll find some guy that gets in power down there, maybe foolish enough to wipe himself out. But, you know, that's what we're counting on. That's what we're counting on. Wouldn't we get a quicker return, a faster return, and a return that probably is going to pay off, you know, much, much more in the long run if we went to education and rehabilitation? Well, Mr. English, and you're talking to somebody who spent 10 years dealing with the enforcement side, but I tell you, I don't want to spend money, whether it's enforcement or on the demand side, unless it works. And whenever we find something that does not work, I don't care whose political strategy is, whether it's the White House, the Congress, Democrats, or Republicans. If the darn thing doesn't work, we ought to pull the plug on it and put the money where it does work. And everything that I've heard you all say is that, you know, the best we can do is it's on a wing and a prayer some way down, probably in the next century. And that just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Now, I know it's not as glamorous politically, you know, it's, it's, it's not as sexy, and certainly the news media doesn't like it nearly as much if, if we're putting it in, into education and rehabilitation. You know, it's a lot more fun to show a few machine guns and boats and gizmos and gadgets and we'll fly them around if we can get the news media to go down and take a look at it. Well, that makes, that makes the evening news, it gets that quickie spot. If we're talking about fighting a real war on drugs, you are the guys that we're going to have to depend on to tell us whether the program's working. And if it comes down to one where it's not even questionable, I mean, we don't even have a prayer until into the next century. Quite frankly, it's crazy to continue to put money into that kind of a program. Let's put the money someplace where it works, and we know it works, and we know we're going to get a return on our money. That's the only point I'd like to make. Do you dis tell me where I'm wrong. No, I uh, am. Can you disagree with anything I've said? Well, I, I can go with the first half. I'm here to uh, report the facts uh, that it leads up to your conclusion that the program is or is not working down there. Okay. The part that I am not prepared to deal with is to put that money into the demand side. I don't okay, have that well, analysis let's, let's, in front let's, of let's, me. Let's just go, will you, do you agree that we ought to pull the plug on this program? Oh, I think it's, uh, I think that we could let it go for just uh, a bit longer. Uh, in How much longer? Well, I think that that's... How many more bucks do you want to spend down there? I'm not really sure that uh, I have that formula in front of me either. Well, now, Mr. Conahan, you're sliding around on me now, and the thing I'm, that we've got to come down to, you know, you're, you're the guy, you're the green eye shade guys. You know, you're the guys that have been doing this evaluation, you've done the study, and, you know, we're sitting up here, we've got a heck of a budget deficit, we've got limitations, we've got all kinds of needs that we need. You know, if this thing isn't going to work, or if we can put our money someplace that's going to give us a bigger return, I think that's what most members of Congress, Democrats, Republicans, would like to do. Mm -hmm. Now, you're the guy that's doing the study. 
I'm, you're the guy that's carrying it out now. And I'm, you're telling me, well, let's let it go a bit longer and just we'll spend a few more bucks. The thing I want to know is how much longer should it go before we make that decision if this is not the proper time to do it, and how many more dollars should we spend? Mr. English, as you know, I'm prepared to uh, provide the analysis based on our study. None of you have given me the vote. Well, I'm not asking you for your vote. I'm just asking <laughs> your opinion. I I I've got an expert in front of me, I'd like to know what he thinks. The program in Peru essentially has not even started. So it's pretty difficult to reach some assessment on a program that hasn't started. Well, looking where it has been going, has it been a program that looks that holds promise or not? Not much. Not much. Well, that's what I was afraid of. Yeah, I'd rather spend it on a program that has some, or a lot, as opposed to not much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, that was very interesting colloquy, uh, Mr. English. You never fail to uh, provide us with one. I, I would uh, hope that you would join with me in looking at the economic dimension of the supply side, which, as much as it, uh, as we've not failed, as we have not succeeded with our own American farmers, I think the one message that we've got through all our Andean hearings, and you were chairman of this subcommittee, so I know you have a, a long-standing interest, is that until we move uh, economics into the, the law enforcement that there is something to replace something with, uh, that, that they're going to be continued failures. And, and that leads to your ultimate conclusion of let's, let's when do we pull the plug? Mr. Chairman, if I may, I, I, I agree with, with what the thrust of the Chairman's remarks. I think that's right. I think that, that this committee has responsibility to look very closely at all programs. Quite frankly, we've all got programs that, that we favor for one reason or another. And I think we need to evaluate, you know, where are we really getting a, a return for a dollar? Some of them are working and working, quite frankly, as well as can be expected. They're delivering what they right. promised. We've got others that are not. We've got other programs, quite frankly, I think, that are waiting in the wings that hold a great deal of promise. Well, this one is fun. not working so well. I think well. that's the way it looks, Mr. May Chairman. I make a very brief comment on that? Last year, about 5 percent of the total, total drug program budget, 5 percent, went into international assistance. Now, went into I, international? International assistance in the right. international narcotics control effort. 5%. Okay. Now, as an inspector general, I would be the last one in the world to say, let's pour money down a rat hole on the basis that we were buying on the come. It may turn out to be a winner downstream. Uh, if it was that simple, I would certainly say, let's bail the hell out right now. Pull the plug. But I don't think it is that simple. I think that we have signs in Bolivia, at least, signs of a success, and we have even more signs in Colombia, where the traffic has been uh, severely disrupted. A lot of people have been, senior people of the uh, cartels, have been locked up. Effectively as we would like, no. But there have been signs of progress. And I would suggest that if you look back in history, I remember when I was in school looking at something about the TVA. I remember the debates about the TVA, and everybody made the same comment. We're not going to know what success is here because it'll take too long, the dams will be built, we'll never know what, uh, if it was worthwhile or not. And yet we look back on it, and it was, it was something very admirable. And maybe, just maybe, that may be the case here. Well, I don't know, sir. It's I going to know. need a lot of fixing, though, for us yes, to it have will a indeed. success picture in the future. And we have some sure. poor mechanisms to deal with it. Mr. I, I, Look, I would agree with you, but I'll tell you what I suspect. You know, I've got a strong suspicion here, and maybe I'm wrong, and, but I, you know, it won't be the first time I am. But I strongly suspect that we have a lot more motives for the Andrian strategy than what has been laid on the table of simply keeping the drugs out of the United States. And I think that we've got foreign policy reasons we're involved down there. We've got all kinds of reasons we're involved down there. And, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong there. I think that's right. But when we start talking about drug dollars in this case, you know, I think that these dollars have got to be evaluated strictly on the basis of, you know, what is this going to do as far as reducing the, the number of people in the United States who have this terrible problem, you know, and, 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 and it burdens our nation. And right. that's where I think we can only look at it on that one basis. I, I appreciate that there are other important needs that we have in the world from a foreign policy standpoint. Thank you. Let's take a recess and we will resume uh, with uh, Mr. Al McCandless of California after this vote. Subcommittee will come to order. 
chair would like to invite Mr. McCandless for any questions or responses he'd like to make to the panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a few questions with your permission I would like to ask the panel. Hopefully it would be beneficial to all concerned, uh, this expression and interchange. Uh, I've listened to your comments in addition to your opening statements with the with the thought that I was trying to place myself in your position, which I understand uh, Mr. Funk was earlier this year, you were doing your exploratory work with your staff in Bolivia. So you're, you're a 1991 report, which would be at what date in 1991? I'm sorry? The report was issued this week. I'm talking about the field work. The field work was done in March and April. March and April, and, and Mr. Uh, Conahan, when was your work done? The uh, work uh, was completed in Peru in June and in Colombia in the uh, January time. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> there seems to be a common thread here with respect to the three countries, even though they're like three different brothers and have to be treated in different ways if we're going to be successful. Um, that common thread is one of, of a lack of the right hand and the left hand coordinating their activities. And I would exempt, if I may, from personal experience in the field, I would exempt those who are in the trenches. Because when you talk to DEA and you talk to Border Patrol and you talk to Customs and you talk to the other people who are in advisory mode relative to the Department of Defense, they all know what one another is doing and they are coordinating the best they can with their counterparts in the country, the host country in question. But I think that's about where the real coordination seems to begin to diminish. And the closer you get to the United States or to <clears throat> the headquarters of the country, the less coordination there ha happens to be. Would, would there be agreement on that, or am I looking at this from the wrong point of view? Partially, Mr. Funk? Sir. Uh, partially. We found something troubling in the base in Chimore. Uh, I found it when I was there last year. The team found it again this past spring. The Special Forces Camp uh, is about not even 50 yards from the DEA uh, area. And yet, they were almost like worlds apart. We found that the Special Forces people, the Army Special Forces people, who are doing a magnificent job, uh, were not really uh, discussing matters, uh, except quite informally with the DEA. And the DEA on their part were also doing a magnificent job, but totally disparate from the Special Forces. And our feeling was that the Army, the training that the Army had, the experience that the Army had, could be put to good stead in uh, giving some advice to the DEA. But they were, they were worlds apart. And uh, to be sure, when uh, each would coordinate well within their own unit, right. but there wasn't the kind of uh, cross-feed that I think would be very helpful. Obviously, that, that would be maybe a desirable thing, but we have two completely separate missions within the country. Yes, sir, absolutely separate. The Department of Defense people are assigned for solely the purpose of training overseeing the training, reviewing the training. They're not field operatives. No, in fact, they're barred from that. DEA, contrary to that, they're not trainers, they're field operatives. And the training that they give is on the spot in terms of recommending to their counterparts during a raid or some other activity, which is entirely different than the Department of Defense's mission. I had reference to the field aspects of it, the Coast Guard, Right. and its riverine activities, the border patrol, so on and so forth, in their instructional process. Now, when we, when we talk in terms of, for example, when uh, I was there in 1989, they were all looking forward to an upgrade of the radio system, their ability to communicate out in the field with uh, the helicopters, with the people on the ground, with the riverine, and that the Department of Defense was going to produce a recommended network of communication systems which would permit these people who are 450 miles from nowhere 
to be able to communicate with someone someplace and let them know if they had a real problem. And I think you, you must, uh, which you gentlemen do, to begin pretty, be pretty sympathetic when you're wandering around and, and uh, you say, well, if you had to land now with that, uh, with that CASAS, which is a little short landing and takeoff, where would you land? And I said, well, the rivers are the best place because everything else is wooded. But the problem with the rivers is they're pretty well infested with various and sundry types of, of animals that uh, kind of shorten your chances of survival if you make it all the way to the ground. And so a radio or some type of communication device becomes more than just listening to the ball game. I further understand that uh, that's still in the mill but has not been done. That's correct. Now, I use this as an example of who in Bolivia using that particular, who in Bolivia has the direct responsibility to coordinate all of this and to follow through and be the catalyst by which it takes place and puts these people out in the field in a little better advantageous position relative to their safety as well as their ability to, to function. Mr. McCandless, the operating responsibility is in the hands of the Deputy Chief of Mission, who is the narcotics coordinator for the mission. The, and that includes all of the U.S. personnel in, uh, in country. The policy responsibility, of course, rests on the ambassador himself. Uh, we found that very discouraging uh, uh, elements, like you mentioned. Uh, only six of the helicopters had uh, high-frequency radios, and the rest of them were, had to resort to uh, commercial uh, uh, regular commercial uh, unsecure uh, traffic. Right, now, let's take the helicopters as an example. Uh, the ambassador sees, or the charge affairs sees, the shortcomings. Um, their responsibility is to communicate these shortcomings with the Department of Defense, with the State Department in Washington, with whom in order to try to correct these shortcomings. The normal path would be from the ambassador up to the uh, uh, International uh, Narcotics Matters Bureau, uh, and possibly to the uh, regional bureau, Inter-American Affairs, uh, because they have a direct support responsibility as well. But these are you're, now you're talking about INM-funded items that normally should go back to INM. And I assure you that the ambassador was not at all reluctant to burn up the cables if he, if he saw a problem. But. The thrust of, of both you gentlemen's uh, discussion and your report that I have read, the outline of it, states that there is a lack of administrative organization where many of the things that I've used uh, in this case as an example fall through the cracks in the floor, which as a result of the general over uh, view of, uh, of the activity and its direction and those who are responsible for accomplishing X, Y, and Z are, are not coordinated, are not given the equipment they need, or some other factor which reduces their productivity within the framework of their responsibility. Now, that's my problem and I need to be uh, in some way uh, prized of of, of uh, is, is, is these, are these corrections uh, in the mill? Or are they being accepted as shortcomings within the system? Let me give you a specific example. In 1990, a large package of radio harnesses and the radios themselves arrived in Bolivia for installation in our helicopters. And that would have solved if they were installed, that would have solved the problem of communications on the part of the... No, uh, no it wouldn't have. It just, just, it just had a partial solving of it. Partial solving. You're right. I'm yeah. sorry. Partial solving. But in, in large part. Uh, what happened is that there was a dispute over who should fund the installation, talking of roughly a million dollars. Uh, who should fund that? Should it be defense money or should it be state money? And because that problem was not resolved at the post, all this equipment was shipped back to Florida, to our support facility in Opalaca in Florida. And to the best of our knowledge, it's still there. Has the Defense Department completed its study and recommendations for the overall radio net? We understand it's completed. We have not seen it yet. I'm but sorry, you said? We have not seen the study, but I understand it has been finished. Yes, sir. Now, once that study is published and the recommendations become a part of, uh, of what's on the table, is the system, quote unquote, in a position to move forward and fund it? 
I would not give you a firm yes on that because we have the awkward situation of certain monies coming through defense, certain monies coming through state, and never the twain shall meet. And unless the funding difficulties are ironed out, uh, it's entirely possible that the uh, communications may not, in fact, be purchased. Who's responsible for ironing out the funding? The honest answer would be it rests upon the goodwill of the two parties involved to work it out jointly. That's not a very happy situation. I, I, I put myself in the position of one of those DEA boys, uh, gentlemen, out in the middle of nowhere, working with my counterparts in the country and saying my life is in most cases is dependent upon how efficiently I can function and operate and if I can't even communicate with my brethren over in another helicopter or another geographical location which is a coordinating uh, activity for a particular mission uh, I'm reducing my chances of becoming uh, eligible for Social Security I would retirement. say that's a fair statement. And, and yet we don't have anything back here that says, well, so-and-so is responsible to coordinate this activity. So-and-so is responsible to see that these things take place so basic in nature that, that they, are, they are like the, uh, the meals and the coffee and the, and the fuel for the planes that we take for granted. And, and I, I, I'm boggled because time after time in both Bolivia and in Peru, I found this to be a fact where we had serious shortages of basic commodities, be they uh, uh, military or uh, utilitarian or whatever the, the definition or category was, that, that severely hindered our ability to function and, and our, our host country counterparts to function in that area. In one case I can think of, through a fluke, it worked out for the better. In Santa Lucia, the base in, in Peru, uh, we needed an airstrip very badly, an airstrip capable of taking, say, a C-130. And the cost, if we, went, if we had gone on a contractor to do that, uh, was estimated to be about $10 million. Instead, the local CORA workers, these are the local uh, Peruvians, built the thing and a magnificent airstrip, very ingenious, well constructed. They brought the whole thing in for about a million dollars. So there's a case where, by avoiding the red tape of going through normal channels, it worked out for the better. But that's a rare exception. But, but uh, we, can't, we can't even get the uh, C-130s to fly in there. <laughs> that's another problem. And uh, the Coast Guard uh, Commandant wouldn't let us fly the C-130 we were involved in with, uh, with uh, the meals that, uh, that we had in that Coast Guard plane. Uh, what do they call them? Meals rejected by Ethiopians, MREs? MREs, yeah. MREs. Uh, he wouldn't let us fly him in there, so we had to, we had to convert them to a C-118 right. to fly in there. And we get to the end of the runway, and we're there 40 minutes to decide whether those engines are working or not well enough to take off to come back empty. And I'm saying to myself, you know, that the Andes is not some place in the desert where everything is flat. Well, we finally got enough something or other in the right engine, and the... And the the contract pilot says, well, I think we can make it all right. And I said, I hope so. This, this is the everyday life of these people. And, yes, sir, and we have somebody over here is not coordinating this because of this and so on and so forth. We've got a vote, I guess, haven't we, Mr. Chairman? Uh, I wanted to leave you with this thought because if there's one thing that you can do for these programs, it is to follow through on what it is that you have found out in your direct responsibility to the system and to try to find these little niches where you put the positive and the negative together and come up with a fix. Mr. McCandless, I interpret one essential part of my job as trying to pin down who's accountable for what. So yes, sir, we will follow through with that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. McCandless. And if you choose to uh, have more questions when we come back, we'll recognize you. Uh, we are called to the floor again for a recorded vote. We'll take a brief recess. The committee will come to order, and the chair would like to recognize Mr. Steve Schiff. Oh, uh, excuse me. Uh, let me let me ask Mr. McClandless to uh, to uh, resume the questions, and then we'll go to Mr. Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a couple more that I would like to ask that I think are relevant. Um, 
Mr. Funk, in your report, you say that the drop-off of law enforcement pressure against drug labs has increased the demand for coca leaf and paste and contribu contributed to the rising of farm gate prices in the Chapari. I noted that uh, you're talking $55 per hundredweight. It wasn't too long ago that uh, it was below 30, which was considered to be the break-even and was yes. an incentive for somebody to look for crop substitutions. In your examination of the program, uh, this is somewhat contradictory in the sense of the law enforcement dropping off when we continue to increase the availability of equipment for that purpose. Can you shed some light on this? No, I didn't say the law enforcement area had dropped off. I said there have been a distinct rise uh, over the past few months. Let me quote here. If OIG report says drop off of law enforcement pressure against drug labs has increased demand for coca leaf and paste and contributed to the rising prices in the Shafari. That's not reports. I don't recall it. The drop off from is related to the law enforcement efforts hmm? in Colombia, which Oh, I see. I see. No, we're talking about something else. We're talking about the, the fact that uh, as people pushed the uh, Colombian processes came across the border into Bolivia, but that was a different, uh, you know, the, there was a uh, uh, drop off in, the, in Bolivia, in Colombia, not in, not in Bolivia. Well, we talked about the, uh, the increased request in the number of, of uh, helicopters, and yet we're also talking about the number of hours that they're being restricted to operating. Uh, isn't that kind of contradictory? The department disagrees with our conclusion, uh, and I'm sure you hear from the department, uh, uh, Mr. Levitsky, later uh, in the session. Uh, they feel, the department feels strongly that uh, they were doing just about right. After all, they say these are very old birds, going back to Vietnam vintage, uh, and that they cannot fly the, the uh, number of hours that uh, we would like. But our figures are the department figures. We don't make these things up. The INM had set originally a 60-hour flying, uh, flying hour program. They then reduced it to a 40-hour program, uh, which we were holding, that was, the, that was the figures that we were using, the 40 hours. In actuality, in the last uh, report that we had, the average was 23 hours. Now, even allowing, even allowing for an old bird, even allowing for the difficult flying conditions, a 23 hours is not a very large uh, number. And in point of fact, during the Operation Safe Haven, a very significant operation, uh, the choppers were doing about 45 hours. And they seemed to uh, handle themselves quite well. They're like the, the U is like the DC-3. You know, they're one heck of a wonderful bird. They go on a long time. Uh, but there's still, uh, there still are limits. And I grant the limits, but they're, mo they're much higher than 23 hours. But your position was one of they don't need the additional six because yes, they're not utilizing what they have to the full extent necessary. We haven't seen a justification for it. They may have one. We have not seen it. And we asked them for it. Okay. I have one other area very quickly, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Conahan, with reference to Peru, we have the two insurgency groups there. We have 250,000 people in the Huaga Valley. We talk, talked about that in my opening remarks, the problem. The uh, president of Peru says that if we're going to bring these people around, we cannot isolate them by military action, that we must work with them in their villages or they become a part of the insurgency. And so, in order to do that, we need to gain their confidence. And he goes on to talk about the program internally that Peru has embarked upon. At the conclusion of which, we would give them weapons of a outdated nature, bold action type things, where they could, uh, given a set of circumstances, defend themselves as a town against the the uh, insurgents. Then we have a situation where we are not going to be fighting the drug people at the same time that we're fighting the two insurgency groups. And if I understand Mr. Fujimura correctly, he said that this program 
along with the other part of the program that I mentioned about the, uh, uh, the cocoa growers, has been reviewed and approved in May of 1991. Is that your understanding? There was uh, agreement uh, between uh, the United States and the government of Peru uh, in that time frame uh, with respect to the provision of military aid. That military aid package has now been changed. It's been reduced by some $10 million because of the further discussions between the administration and the Congress. The administration now has to go back to uh, Peru with, with the revised program. So that initial program is no longer operable or no longer can be funded out of the uh, reduced funding. We're talking about the, uh, the policy here, which is somewhat contra contrary to what our concept would be of, uh, of trying to progress in reduction of cocoa leaf uh, production. The, that, that concept that has been forwarded and, and implemented by Mr. Fujimura is uh, one that he says he got concurrence with in the United States in May of 1991. Let me ask Mr. Brummett to comment on that, please. Uh, to our knowledge, uh, this idea on uh, providing weapons to people in the towns, so like a civil defense uh, force, as I understand it, that has not been uh, coordinated within the different agencies of the U.S. government, and we haven't seen a detailed plan for that uh, that's been improved by both uh, governments. Right. <clears throat> I guess in, in conclusion, I'd like to make a couple of comments, and if you were, wish to comment on Education is obviously the key element to a ultimate success of a drug program. However, the commitment that we have made in these three countries I think is proper and needs to be a part of the overall formula for ultimate success, fully realizing we're not going to reduce in the final analysis all people from, from drugs, but we can maintain an acceptable standard as we have in the past. If you uh, gentlemen had three things. You were in total control and you had three things that would help to uh, speed the process up realizing what we had to work with in each of the countries in terms of, of their environment, politically, socially, and economically. What would be those three things? I suppose uh, if I can just uh, use uh, Peru uh, as an illustration to answer uh, your question. Uh, and I don't have the answer here, but uh, one of the, the three things, I would uh, attempt to find out what incentives the government of Peru uh, has uh, in order to uh, move towards overcoming these major obstacles that we talked about earlier and then provide as part of the program what is necessary to incentivize them to uh, do that. As I said, I don't have the answer to do, uh, here, here before us, but I do think that that's very important. That's one thing. Uh, the second thing is that I think that before uh, each of the uh, individual agencies, U.S. agencies, move out, that we do need more of a coordinated and consolidated plan in order to make sure that we do have a coordinated and consolidated uh, uh, program. And then thirdly, I would ask that we uh, put in place uh, some effectiveness uh, measurement system so that uh, we know uh, right from the outset what our, our, our goals and objectives are and know how we are achieving them as we go along. I guess that's the way I would construct this thing. I don't differ from Mr. Conahan. I would say that democracy is inherently a messy type of government and I can understand why we have difficulties in coordinating effectively in Washington. But the fact of the matter is that if we're going to succeed in operating in a foreign milieu, in an overseas country, uh, in something as complex as the counter-narcotics program, we had darn well better assure to the best we can that we speak with a single voice that we don't have the problem you mentioned about on the one hand this and the other hand that. Uh, we cannot afford that. So my first, my first priority, I think, would be that we first speak cohesively as a government in how we handle this overseas. The second would be, I think, clearly 
at least in Bolivia, I cannot speak for Peru and, and Colombia, I suspect in Peru would be likewise, uh, we have to get the best talent we can and try to develop with the Bolivians and above all with the Bolivians, not on our own. We can't hand this on a platter. It has to be self-developed with our assistance. A very comprehensive program. What can be grown in the Chapari area, possibly even in the Beni? What can be grown? How would we grow it? Where would we market it? We have all kinds of marketing skills in this country. I would think that we can put that to very effective use in the, in the, in the countries that are drug producers. And that would include in that uh, uh, Southeast Asia as well as the Andean region. And I guess third would be not to let up on the pressure in law enforcement. Because when we let up the pressure, the price of coca is going to go sky high. We have to somehow keep up enough law enforcement operation going that will restrict the prices from going through the roof. Because if the price of coca, coca continues to be high or even increases, uh, there's nothing we can do, nothing we can do that will uh, uh, eradicate it short of uh, herbicidal spraying or something else which is politically impossible. No. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You've been very lenient with the time. Well, uh, you've had a lot of experience over there. Uh, you have almost as many uh, war stories as some of the DEA people coming back, uh, uh, Al, and I appreciate your, your dedication uh, to the committee in staying with this subject. Uh, you know, I've said outside of this hearing room, our witnesses are, are if, any, if anything, uh, understating the, the nature of the problem here. We, we've got a, a serious problem in mismanagement uh, and oversight. And Al McCandless's question led me to think of, of how you might respond in a different setting. Uh, replace the State Department officials making the policy and get some good talent. Uh, negotiate an economic program, but still keep effective law enforcement. And of course, both of those things would, would uh, require uh, replacing the premises that underlie the Andean strategy. Uh, and I, I think that, that there is some, something to be found in your response and in, in my volunteered response to the McCandless question. Uh, we can't go on like this. The question is, how are we going to fix it up? But we can't fix it up until we acknowledge what the problems are in the first place. And that's what this government operations uh, oversight hearing is all about. So again, Mr. McCandless, I, I thank you for your continued dedication thank on you. the subject. And recognize uh, our friend on the Judiciary Committee and government operations, Mr. Steve Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, I'll be, I'll be brief here because uh, the other prior questioning has answered most of my questions. Uh, I do have just one observation to make about drug interdiction as a career prosecutor, which I was before coming to Congress. I believe there is a place for interdiction in the overall anti-drug strategy, but I agree with statements made by my colleagues and I think by Mr. Funk that I'm concerned about the body count, the, uh, the claims of success based upon how much in the way of drugs has been interdicted. In my opinion, interdiction should be measured on what is actually getting into the United States, not what we are just stopping en route. Now, one might ask, aren't those the same? And the answer is not necessarily. If the drug traffickers plan for a certain amount of interdiction and only that interdiction takes place and they still get to this country and elsewhere that amount which they are seeking to get across, then really we've imposed nothing more than a, than a cost of doing business upon them which they're ready to absorb. And all these uh, photo opportunities of, uh, of drug catches and the drugs laid out for the press don't mean that anything is actually happening, uh, happening out in the streets. Thank you for letting me make that statement, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, I have two areas I would like to ask about. And both of these are to kind of put into context the testimony which you've given in, uh, here today. One of which is, I have, I have here both of the audit reports from the, from the GAO and from the, uh, from the State Department in, Inspector General's office. 
And I wonder if, uh, if the two of you or your agencies have looked at each other's reports and kind of compared notes. Now, I realize they're different countries, so maybe that is not practical, but if it is practical and if it has been done, I wonder if you have an assessment of each other's observations that you might share with us. Mr. Conahan? Yes. Um, we uh, have been talking with uh, one another right from the outset of our uh, respective reviews. And uh, the Department of State review uh, got into the programs uh, at a deeper uh, level than, than we did ourselves. But we recognize, therefore, that the uh, outcomes uh, would be a little bit different. And whereas we did uh, identify uh, the same kinds of problems that the, the State Department Inspector General identified, that we would not have uh, the ki kind of detailed illustration behind it. But other than that, I think that we've come out uh, uh, the same. Uh, I agree with, uh, uh, the with the findings and conclusions of, uh, of that report, and uh, I will let it to uh, Mr. Funk as to uh, his comment on uh, our reports. Mr. Funk? I found the GAO report, both of them on Colombia and Peru, extremely interesting, and the report on Peru very sad because I had expected so much more, from, not from the report, but from the, the uh, program in, in Peru. Uh, I had been there, uh, looked at the program in operation. I thought that some of the, the caliber of some of the people involved was absolutely outstanding. Uh, the ambassador in Peru is a former deputy IG, uh, Tony Quainton, one of the best in the Foreign Service. And with that type of person involved, with the clear commitment uh, of the department to support it, uh, I found that the conclusions that I thought were inescapable in the, in the GAO report, uh, to me, were very saddening. But I, uh, uh, I'm delighted also that uh, coming at it from totally different contexts, uh, we both arrived at essentially the same conclusions. And I think this uh, is an answer to those people who would protest it. I find it difficult to believe that the GAO, the Department of Defense IG, and the State IG independently would arrive at the same conclusion without some basis in fact. Well, that brings me to my second area that I'd like to ask you both about. Uh, I understand the problems that have been illustrated in both of your reports. And I want to make it clear, I don't think any problem should be discounted or treated lightly. But I also believe at the same time, problems need to be put into the context of an entire operation. No program is without problems. I, I know you won't believe this, but Congress has some problems sometimes that I've noticed. I've so, been suspecting uh, that. Uh, well, some, many people have, and I, I, think, I think we can confirm that. So the question is, not that there are problems, but how they fit into the overall pro present effectiveness and projected effectiveness of the Andean strategy. That is, uh, are the problems uh, significantly interfering with the success of that operation, are the problems being dealt with, and so forth. So from that point of view, um, I wonder if you both can assess where you think the Andean strategy is now and, and where it's going, uh, if the positives with the negatives. Um, Mr. Funk, may I begin with you first, sir? As I tried to get across to Mr. English before in uh, reply to his question, it's very easy for an IG to find fault in a program because we, after all, we come, we're not responsible for doing, we're responsible for looking. And it's very easy for us to, to come in and find fault. And we do that regularly. But that also has to be kept in perspective. Because sometimes we, it's very, uh, uh, we find fault and we don't give sufficient praise. In point of fact, as I tried to point out in my testimony, we have seen very significant improvement in the situation in Bolivia. I cannot back this up with statistics any more than anybody else can back it up with statistics for the obvious reason nobody really knows what those statistics should be. But the fact of the matter is that we have found improvement and I believe that that should be taken into consideration together with the faults that we find. I would suspect, and this may sound like heresy, I would suspect that some of the faults we found are nowhere near as significant as some of the successes. But that doesn't decrease the fact or eliminate the fact that we must deal with them. Uh, we're not going to get perfection. I never expect perfection. I do expect that we'll uh, come to grips with the difficulties that we find and uh, uh, put in our reports. And the department has overwhelmingly done that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, when we criticize, that should not be taken as uh, a desire to pull the plug on something. This is a very worthwhile effort. 
I think it's important. I think we have to make darn sure it's done as effectively as we can. I'm not convinced that's the case yet, but we're getting there. We're getting there. Mr. So Funk I feel that uh, uh, I'm not by any means hopelessly uh, pessimistic about it. And, and, and no one would take the criticisms lightly. They're a necessary part of evaluating a program. But if you were to, if you were to give the program a letter grade, a, 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 B, C, or D, and how it's doing overall, if, if you would care to do so, what, what grade would you give it? In Bolivia, I would give us a B minus, and the, and the host government probably a C minus. Mr. Connie, I'm going to ask you the same question. How do you feel overall, uh, not diminishing any problems that have been located, but overall the program is doing? I think you have to uh, take uh, each country uh, separately. Uh, in the case of uh, Colombia, uh, I think that uh, one of the fundamental tenets uh, has been uh, largely met and that is getting the uh, commitment of the uh, Colombian government to uh, undertake uh, the reforms that are necessary and to work with the uh, assistance being provided uh, in order to carry out uh, those programs. So there are indicators there that uh, the strategy uh, might work, and I say might work because we don't have the mechanisms in place to actually measure whether uh, they're going to work. Uh, I would contrast that with the uh, situation in Peru where uh, certainly from the beginning we didn't have the kind of commitment necessary to uh, overcome the uh, uh, very serious uh, obstacles to uh, a program working in that country. Uh, we are seeing some uh, recent uh, uh, commitment. I, I don't know whether that's the word. Uh, we are seeing some recent agreement in any event to begin talking more seriously about the things that need to be done uh, in that country. But in point of fact, it, by just by looking at uh, two of the obstacles that we talked about earlier, uh, there's very little in the way of accomplishment, and I'm not sure that uh, unless things dramatically change that uh, we're going to see accomplishment uh, in, in the near term at all. Uh, one has to do with gaining control over the military and the police. Uh, the uh, agency that the president promised would be established indeed was established, but as we found at the time that we were there, that this uh, agency was not funded, uh, there was no budget for it, therefore it existed only on paper. Well, if that's the way in which you're going to go about gaining control and you don't uh, give it uh, the wherewithal in order to do its job, it, it's not going to work. Uh, so I'm uh, somewhat uh, pessimistic that uh, we're going to see the kind of activity in that country in, in the near term. One last question, for, please, Mr. Conahan. And what you've just described in Peru, are those problems primarily the result of some um, mistake or error that the United States government is making in approaching the situation in Peru, or is, does the problem primarily rest with the Peruvian government? As I've uh, sat here, I've, I've wrestled with the answer to that question. Um, I guess what we need to do uh, as a uh, country here is to ask ourselves to do whatever analysis is required to answer the question as to whether any of these things are doable, the things that we call obstacles to the program being successful. Are they doable? And if they're not doable, then we have to find a new strategy. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Schiff, Chairman. Just, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Okay. Funk, please. I've been sitting here thinking also, in an earlier incarnation, I was an assistant director of the old Office of Minority Business uh, Enterprise. And we had the charter given to by President Nixon when he came over to uh, try to force the minority business development in the United States. Did we succeed? Not in the years I was there, and not since. But we've gone a long way. And I have to say that looking back on that program and the effort that we put into it and the money that went into it, Overall, I think that there has been a success. Completely, of course not. A long way to go. But the country is better now because we had that effort. I have to say, I probably think about the, the drug program much the same way. Is it completely successful? Heck no. Will it be successful? We don't know that either. But I believe that we're better off for trying. And I think, therefore, we have no option but to do it. I thank you, gentlemen. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Well, we want to thank uh, everybody here for their effort. It's, it's been an important one. Uh, <clears throat> we have all uh, gone through the problems and uh, 
realize there are serious strategy questions remaining and the fact uh, is been made more than once that uh, with limited funds we should make sure that the programs we use work. Uh, undelivered trucks and uh, unaccounted petty cash alone $150,000 I think that's uh, sheer stupidity. Uh, we could put uh, 300 students uh, into a uh, semester of uh, community colleges for the for, for uh, a failure of oversight to merely even account for what's happening here. It's, it's like uh, an era of throwing money around in an exceedingly reckless way uh, with no accounting whatsoever. And if between GAO and the Inspector General's office, if we, if we can't correct it, then it's probably going to have to be closed down. And I thank you very much for your important testimony today and Mr. Brummett and Mr. Deering for accompanying Mr. Conahan and Mr. Funk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Let's see, where is that? Quinton, Q-U-A-I-N-T-O-N. Anthony Quinton. Q-U-A-I-N-T-O-N. <clears throat> Next panel of witnesses is the uh, Assistant Secretary of State for International Narcotics Matters, who is accompanied by the former Ambassador Robert Gelbard, uh, who is now Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Inter-American Affairs. Uh, Mr. Levitsky is Assistant Secretary of State and a former Executive Secretary to the Department of State and has held many positions overseas, was an ambassador himself uh, in uh, Eastern Europe at an earlier time. We welcome the witnesses and uh, ask them to uh, Let's, let's uh, bring them out of hiding. It's okay to come out now, State Department. I thought I'd like to share with you whatever value it might be. Yes, I recognize the gentleman. Ambassador Gelbard is a, a hands-on type of person. During the time that he was ambassador in Bolivia from 1988 through 1991, he spent a great deal of time in the field seeing firsthand what was taking place rather than sitting at an oak desk back in La Paz reading reports and uh, so we we can get a view and the information will be very valuable for the ambassador because of his first hand involvement. Well I remember visiting uh, the ambassador uh, in his other duties uh, uh, only a couple years ago myself. Was it less than a year? Chairman, I, I would suggest that he stay out of the auto club business, though, because some of the roads that he takes uh, get kind of deep in water. Uh, gentlemen, uh, <coughs> we've introduced you already, and uh, I, I want you to uh, be sure to have a copy of the uh, letter that I sent the other assistant secretary dated October 10th, inviting him to join you here, Mr. Levitsky. I talked to uh, Mr. Aronson this morning about his absence and the misunderstanding that surrounded it and made it clear to him that we will need him at a future hearing. That's for the record. And I'll send him a letter to that effect as well. 
Thank you. We welcome you and have your prepared statement and uh, invite you to uh, proceed as you will, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, I'm the Assistant Secretary for Nar uh, International Narcotics Matters, which means that I am the State Department official in charge of, nar of these narcotics programs that, you're, that you were uh, discussing today. But uh, the pol have excuse me just a minute. Uh, just, I just want to make sure that the reason we were trying to get Mr. Aronson is that he was in charge of the policy questions that, that deal with international narcotics. I'm sorry, that, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's, in, not correct. that's incorrect, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I am in charge of the policy that deals with international narcotics matters. Mr. Aronson, of course, is in charge of policy dealing uh, in those issues within his purview, which is Latin America. In some areas, the policies that, that I am to oversee take place in his area, and we work together very closely, of course. Uh, that we have no conflict, in other words, in that. All I'm saying to you is that... So there are two the, people making policy. The President of the United States makes policy in this regard. The President makes the policy that's on... Right. That's where you get it from. That's exactly right. From the President's strategy... Well, don't you recommend to him? Absolutely. And we generally recommend jointly, and we okay. work together to make the recommendations. I see. Well, then that makes it more important, and I don't even know what Aronson does there, but you've made it clear that he does something uh, different from what we thought. He isn't here this morning and today. But his, but his senior deputy is, of course. That isn't good enough for me. I've, I've, I've met his, the ambassador, and we wanted the one that was making policy with you. We didn't want his assistant. We don't want your assistant with all due respect to all the assistance of everybody in the executive branch. Well, I think this, in any case, if, if whatever, whatever this particular issue is, is, I think it's less important than what you want to hear from me about the substance of the thing. So I'm glad to have the opportunity to enter my statement. I do not intend to read it. It's a very long statement. So if I could have it entered into the record, I'd appreciate it. Well, all the uh, prepared statements will be Thank received you. into the record, including your, your Thank own. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, the ambassadors, if he has one. We have a... Mr. Chairman, we have a joint statement, and it was presented by Assistant Secretary Levitsky. Thank you. May, may I uh, say, say a few words, Mr. Chairman, though, just in summary? You, you certainly may. Thank you. That's what we've, we've waited for you to appear for. Okay. Um, one of the pro I've read these three reports. I got them the final reports at 4 o'clock yesterday afternoon, but I'd had a chance to read some of the drafts before, so I knew basically what the content was of, of these three reports. I looked at them very carefully, and I thought about what we have been doing for two years. And at one point, I thought to myself, I'm not sure I can understand which countries these reports are describing or what strategy they're describing. Because we have had a strategy for the last two years, the President's strategy, to deal with the cocaine problem in this country as the major drug problem that we have seen that has been laid out before the Congress. I have been here, I counted my schedule 16 times before the Congress in the last year and a half that has been thoroughly debated within the Congress and the public that has been put out publicly in the President's strategies. And it is far, when you, and when you read the three reports, you get really no impression of what that strategy has either supposed to do or what it has accomplished. So I thought I would just take a few minutes, if I might, to, to just uh, focus on that issue. You say you read the reports yes. and they give you no idea of what again? The reports, when you read them, le let me make it more specific. The reports, when you read them, leave an impression that there is a foundering, floundering effort going on without any strategy behind it, uh, seemingly done by people who don't know what they're doing, uh, that there has been no progress and no success. And I think that that is not descriptive. And so I would like to concentrate, well, one, on the strategy that we have uh, put forward, if I might. Well, you know, Mr. Secretary, you might have at least taken the time to listen to them because both of them went to exceeding pains to refute the assertion that there have been no successes. Well, As a matter of fact, I thought they were pretty generous in their assessment about the, 
the successes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've looked at the reports and I didn't gain that impression. I think other members of the committee here have done the same. And our staff has been going over, over it pretty considerably. And the language that you describe is quite frankly a little exaggerated. And if you'd, if you'd like to refer to some parts in the report in which uh, that kind of impression is drawn, I would be happy to refer. To, but in, their, in the parts of the report I read, and in the statements they made today, uh, they were both very careful to say that there have been successes. Well, I'm glad to hear that. But I notice in your own opening statement, Mr. Chairman, you said, uh, after referring to the strategy, today we find that these statements are only so much bravado and not substantiated by facts. The reality is that the drug war is not succeeding. And then you go on to mention other things. My well, I'm sense glad of that you, is, my I'm sense glad of you that is, me. excuse me, may, may I just finish that thought? My yes. sense of that is that you read the reports and that's the impression you got as well. Well, then you ought to quote me then and not, uh, not them. And uh, that's the impression that I get, but that is not what they said. Well, and I think there's a difference uh, between you disagreeing with my, my evaluation of it and what they actually have said here and said in their reports. So quoting me, Mr. Ambas Mr. Secretary, is hardly a reason to justify your conclusion. Well, all right. I'll, I'll drop that. That's, well, thank that, you very uh, much. I'll drop that particular line, but I, I must say that since this committee focused on these three reports and you made a statement which indicated that you felt there wasn't success, my assumption was that you had read the reports and you felt that based on those reports we were not having a success, which yes, I think is Yes, but that isn't what you said. You said that the, the GAO and the IG made those conclusions and I disagreed with you that they came here and made it very clear that they thought that there were okay. successes. Well, my you... view was different. All right. And okay. I, I don't mind you uh, rereading it back into the record, but that isn't the basis upon which you make your statements about what the IG and the, and the GAO has okay. done. I don't think that's very fair. OK, may I go on? Yes, okay. sir, you may go on. Let me just say a few words about the strategy. We developed a comprehensive strategy after much uh, consultation with our embassy and within the interagency structure, which includes uh, all, the, all the governmental agencies that are involved in drug control and the foreign policy agencies as well. And basically what we developed was, as part of the President's overall strategy, a leaf to street strategy. That meant that we wanted to attack the drug problem at every particular point where we could make it vulnerable, from the leaves in Peru to the streets of the United States. And the President proposed a strategy which did, did just that. In terms of the foreign policy aspect of this, our main goal was to disrupt, dismantle the trafficking organizations. We changed from a strategy which was strictly focused on cutting down coca to a strategic attack on organizations on cutting the ties between the traffickers and the growers, on going after the criminal drug industry structure, on providing assistance, whether it was law enforcement or military assistance, where militaries were involved in the problem in those particular countries based on local decisions, in an attempt to bolster the effort and to use our resources in any way we could to bolster the political will of those countries and help build institutions that could deal with the drug trade, knowing that our main job was here at home in reducing demand, but that the supply element, because it affected price, availability, and the tendency of people to use the drugs, was part of the problem as well. So we have been building these institutions uh, we came up with a strategy. Congress approved it. We had a debate over it. We got the funding, at least for part of it. And we set out about two years ago to put this into effect. We wanted to try to bring the price of coca down at the farm gate to the farmers so that we could use economic assistance, which we had requested from the Congress, to attract them into legitimate industry. The way we understood you had to do that and, and uh, the situation has proven that to be true is strong 
law enforcement strong interdiction against trafficking organizations which kept the price of coca down. And we, where we have seen successes, it has always uh, been accompanied by a strong law enforcement and interdiction effort on the part of lo local forces. And I stress again, this is not the United States doing that job. These are Colombians, Bolivians, Peruvians, trained, yes, by the United States, equipped often by the United States, but local forces. We have, in addition, and one of the things that is not reflected in these reports, which, which is, I think, helpful to keep in mind at least, is that it is not just an Andean strategy. It is a comprehensive hemispheric strategy. We have a strategy for Mexico. We have a strategy for the surrounding countries and the transit countries. And I would note that the Inspector General expresses some concern uh, about what is happening with the drug industry in the, in the countries that, uh, that uh, border on the main coca producing countries. We have a strategy to bolster international efforts, which includes a strong international attack on chemicals that are used to make the drugs, on money through money laundering regulations so that the trafficking organizations can't move their money around as, as easily as they, as they would like to, on things like carrier control initiatives and customs cooperation, on reforming the United Nations, which has its own drug control element to make it more effective, and in infusing drug interests into the fabric of our foreign policy, a most important thing, and, a thing, and a, uh, uh, an issue on which the Department of State had been criticized in the past. That is, that we were not participating in the drug war. Well, I can assure you we are, and that our foreign policy is infused with this as a top-level national interest. Now, you get a sense that there has been some result from these reports, but let me just say, just tick off a number of things that our policy after two years has accomplished. We have built a strong international anti-drug coalition or a consensus. We have a variety of forums for doing this. We have the, the participation of a number of countries in the developed world in assisting in this. And we certainly have a strong and stronger United Nations organization to deal with this as well. Secondly, in Colombia and Mexico alone last year, 100 metric tons of cocaine was seized, often using U.S. training and U.S. equipment. Dozens of traffickers who were walking the streets, parading themselves as, as decent citizens, are now behind bars in places like Colombia, in places like Bolivia. They're behind bars, some of them are on the run, and some of them are dead. You wouldn't have been in Colombia, would you? Oh, I couldn't get, I, I mean, the figure, if you talk about overall traffickers, you're talking about thousands of people. If you're talking about major traffickers, for example, I'll just give you an example of Colombia. Maybe that would be uh, the best example. 20, uh, 27 were extradited to the United States in the early days. And then after, after the Colombian uh, Constituent Assembly changed its law and they had this uh, uh, plea bargaining process that you have probably heard of in, or has been mentioned in some of these reports, Another, uh, another 15 major traffickers turned themselves into Colombian justice are now behind bars. That gives you a sense of just the, the higher level ones, but there are traffickers, middlemen, financiers, distribution people who have been put, thousands of them who have been put in jail. Well, Mr. Secretary, with all due respect, I consider that anecdotal material uh, why, there, why is it anecdotal? Like, if I, I can provide you the you, names of the traffickers, you, if you'd like. Well, if you could, that would I'd solve the discussion. That. You started off saying there were dozens, and then you took a specific example of Columbia where there were 25. Is that, is that the way you make a report about the, the depth of this kind of struggle that we're talking about? Lots of people are getting locked up. I don't think that that's appropriate, to be quite honest with you. It's, it's anecdotal material. With all due respect, it's, it is not anecdotal. There are specific examples of major traffickers who run major organizations who traffic in drugs that come to the United States who are no longer functioning. I say that because it was a main element of our strategy to deal with the high-level elements of the trafficking organizations and the infrastructure. I would mention some other things in addition to that. The uh, hundreds of, of laboratories, that's not anecdotal. 
That can I can give you all the figures on this. Well, look, we're here at hundreds a hearing. Of airstrips, Mr. We're he we're here at a hearing. Yes. We have got hundreds of these, dozens of these, lots of those, and you're going to sub submit the figures Absolutely. later. Wonderful way to that that's that should solve the whole thing. Okay. Uh, after the after next week, we'll get your numbers and then we'll be able to match up what you said. It won't make for much of a hearing of where the government in the Congress talks to the executive branch about a plan, but it sure makes a heck of a presentation that lots of things are happening. Well, I don't, I don't know what, you're, what you expect. Well, Mr. I just Chairman. wanted you to bring the reports with you, I the numbers we'll submit, with you. I'll have them. We'll submit them right now. Well, I thought you said you were going to submit them later, but you've got I'm them sorry. now. Well, I meant that, submit that them later, help. which means after my testimony. In, a, in other here. words, Mr. Secretary, and I don't mean to interrupt you, and I'll try not to interrupt you till you finish your presentation. But, you know, we're, we're talking about two other, other reporting agencies that came here with facts and figures, mm -hmm. and you've used my quotations to discredit them, and then you're talking here in general figures telling me that I should be happy that you'll give them to me at the end of your testimony. They're not in your testimony. Or you'll get them to me after the hearing, which is fine. I'll, I'll receive the, uh, them then. I might mention that it is in the congressional record since every year we submit these figures to another. Well, committee. I should have looked up the congressional record on the day you submitted it, and I would have it. I wouldn't have to ask you for right, it. Fine. Well, you, you will get them, Mr. Chairman. Well, you, you, you know what? This is, exp this is explaining a lot to me. This is explaining a lot to me about this program. It's telling me why we're having problems. You haven't, we haven't even begun to examine, even in disagreement, the reports of these two agencies. And I'd be happy to, to, to uh, accept those. I, I wasn't there. I didn't do the field audits. I assume that they're correct, but they don't have to be. And I would, I would welcome anything about the GAO reports before you mm -hmm. and the State Department's IG inspection that you precisely have some exception to. I'm happy to do that. That's what the hearings are for, sir. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I thought that since uh, we had been uh, sitting here for an hour and a half and you've had a long hearing, that at least we should have an opportunity to give you a sense what we believe, which is that the President's strategy is succeeding. And I thought I would bolster that by giving you some elements of success, but if you prefer not to have that, I can go on specifically to these, uh, to these particular points that the report makes, or let you answer, ask your questions. That's fine, too. We're prepared to ask, answer any question that you have about these. Well, about that's these okay. I'm handling things. the way this is going to be run. Whatever you uh, like to You do. make all the anecdotal general statements supporting the president's policy you want and take as long as you want. You're, you're well, our guest here, and I'll be happy to stay and listen as long as you want to. And then you're going to get to what we came right. here for. Mr. With, uh, with great respect, Mr. Chairman, it's yeah. your hearing, so I will do what, what, you, what you think is best. In well, order I've to just enlighten. indicated okay. to you the way I'd like to proceed. I'd like to accommodate you and excuse me for uh, raising my tone of voice. But, but this, you know, I've been doing this for a number of years, and this is a little bit different from the way it usually goes down. So you, you, tell, you explain us to us the President's program, you use all the references and statements you want to make, and then in any way that you want to, if you have any comments specifically about the GAO report and the IG audit, we would welcome them, and then we will go to right. questions, if that's okay with you. If it's all right with you, Mr. Chairman, you're it's the chairman. It's fine with me, sir. Okay. Let me address the specific elements of the reports generically, if I might. There are several, uh, what I would consider to be points that are focused on. Coordination is one, the use of the military is another, monitoring of assistance is another, measures of effectiveness or performance is another, human rights, and then there are some specific charges with regard, or some uh, issues raised with regard to, uh, I would say, mo mainly Peru and Bolivia. Uh, on coordination, uh, I was surprised, uh, frankly, to see in the Bolivia report 
that there is a sense on the part of inspectors, even though they were there a short time, that there was not coordination in Bolivia. Because quite frankly, as Assistant Secretary for International Narcotics Matters, I have always used the Bolivia program as the prime example of how a program can be coordinated in the field, how an ambassador's leadership, a deputy chief of missions leadership, and a narcotics coordinating committee can work together with such things as a joint intelligence committee, a tactical assessment team, which is there, and an operations group to bring operations together on the basis of well-planned uh, operations, well, uh, well thought through intelligence. So all I can say on the coordination uh, item is that in Washington, we have mechanisms for coordination. We meet twice a week in Washington at a one level below mine and then once a week at, at my level. In the field, each one of these embassies has an ambassador and a deputy chief of mission who is the narcotics coordinator designated as such with a narcotics coordinating committee operating, often meeting every day, sometimes not so often, but coordinating. And that includes the, the DEA in the committee, State Department, the political section, the economic section in some, in some cases, the intelligence community, the cust customs if it's represented, and they control the operations. And, and I will, at some point, I would like to turn this over to Ambassador Gelbart to tell you how this works in practice. But in any case, that I believe, we do not agree with that particular uh, criticism of lack of coordination. Secondly, on, on the use of the military, I believe there's an under uh, a basic misunderstanding here, or maybe an impression left, that somehow it was our policy to push the militaries of these countries into the drug war. Now, we have always been, and, I've, and when I've testified for the, for, by the, uh, in front of the Congress, I've always been very honest in saying that we believe the problem was so big that it went beyond police forces, but that we would not press military assistance unless a country made a decision that it would involve its military. And in all three countries, in one way or another, that decision has been made. Not with the same role, because all of them, and they, they all signed the Cartagena Agreement, all of them considered the problem primarily, primarily, Mr. Chairman, to be one of law enforcement. But they all recognized the need to have support from military units that were well-trained and could offer support, and in some cases, for example, in Colombia, a direct role in particular areas where insurgents were operating and where they felt the military was the proper institution to make uh, counter, to do counter-narcotics activity. So our the use of the military has been quite well defined. It is essentially a support to law enforcement institutions, and particularly in those cases where insurgents and drug traffickers work together and you can't separate them, the military has an exceedingly important role. In this, in the, on the question of monitoring, which is raised in, in all of the reports in one respect or another, I would say uh, more so with regard to the, um, to the uh, Columbia report. It is true, it is true that when President Barco in 1989, after the assassination of, a, of one of the presidential candidates, decided to declare, to declare an all-out war on drugs that we did rush to provide aid. And we came up to the Congress with a package of uh, totaling $65 million of drawdown to defense stocks for both the police and the military, often involving lift capability, helicopters that is, to rush in and help him. And it is true that perhaps all, every T wasn't crossed and every I wasn't dotted on how we were going to monitor. We have since gotten this together. Uh, the program in Colombia, for example, involves their inspector general. It involves sworn statements on equipment. It involves spot checks by U.S. military. We, U.S. military is prohibited, as you know, from going out in operations. It involves monitoring by elements of the embassy, like the Narcotics Affairs Section, which is the se uh, section that basically administers our programs. And, though, and that same procedure is duplicated in other countries. Now, it, 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 I, I accept uh, criticism because the program is not perfect, absolutely, and we want to make it, we want to make it better in terms of end-use monitoring. But if the impression is that we have no monitoring system, 
then I want to alleviate that impression. We have a good system, it is a functioning system, and it will get better. On the, uh, uh, the question of uh, management of programs, uh, there were a lot of criticisms of my bureau, and particularly in the Inspector General's report, not in the other two reports. Uh, I found that very curious since the Inspector General himself has been quoted as pointing to us as a model of at least getting our act together in the last couple of years. Particularly in the time that I have uh, been in office, which is two years, I have spent a large amount of my time on the management of programs, on responsibility, on internal controls. One of the criticisms, in fact, that we've had is that, and it's reflected in the Inspector General's report, procurement is too slow. Well, the government procurement regulations almost breed slowness, but they are designed to protect the government and the taxpayer against abuses of authority, and we have to work within it. We have to make it smoother, but we have to work within it. And I have spent a great deal of time in trying to get that management together. Uh, we have sent people to the field before, as is suggested in, in uh, one of these reports, to do field trips to help people in our uh, narcotics affairs sections with procurement practices, with management of money. Uh, you mentioned in your statement, Mr. Chairman, uh, the reports have, uh, have, excuse me, for example, in Bolivia, the U.S. paid more than $100,000 for six trucks and only got three. The other three were 47, uh, worth $47,000 were never delivered. In 1989, over 50 vehicles were missing and unaccounted for. Cash advances totaling over $100,000 are being written off, yet petty cash problems were supposed to have been solved. And you say there are problems of waste and abuse well, that must be addressed. I'm glad you're referring to my statement. At least you read that. I, got I read the, the report. It says that in the report, and I want to clarify that on the report. record. It's in the report. I want to clarify that. I don't know that why you, you keep, I, I'm proud of you repeating my statement, but uh, why do you keep using my statement instead of the because report? Because I'm using it to illustrate a point on management. The first place, those incidents that we're talking about are four years old. Well, in so the second what? place, as we have responded to the Inspector General in his report, well, if you're going to cite that as an example of waste and abuse, then you better get the facts straight, Mr. Chairman. And well, I take that as a per and I, when I hear waste and abuse or mismanagement, I take that very seriously. Well, I'm glad you do. Uh, well, will as you explain seriously as anyone in government, and when I see that in writing from a, a person who has respect as the chairman of a committee, I want to have the chance to respond to that. Well, in other you words, my statement coming report. from the statement coming from me means more than the statement coming from the people that gave it to me. Well, the statement coming from you does mean a lot to me. You're a committee chairman. In other chairman. words, you're I should have checked them out to find out when it was and, and what it... Well, okay, that, that's fine. Uh, I apologize that I didn't if put in four you years. I respect you more than the inspectors. I would say yes, you're an elected member of Congress. Of course I do. Well, I'm not and asking you for your now. respect. I'm talking about using my statement instead of the, the original source where it came from. Well, we're you not took here. It out of the report. Just a moment, please. Uh, we're not here to review my opening statement, which, which you have done, and I suppose we can continue to do because it's okay with me. We were really here to talk about the Inspector General audit on Bolivia and the GAO mm -hmm. uh, audits on Peru and Colombia, from which is from the source that I got the, the statements that I used. That's right, and I want to point out to you that the source where you got the statements does not make it clear that these cases are basically four years old, that we have been working on them, and in fact, does not say in the report that in the one case, I'll refer to the, not your statement, but the, to the inspector's statement of $100,000. This was a case that happened before either I or Ambassador Gelbard were involved, and we asked, we asked the Inspector General to come look into the case and help us try to solve it. So I want to just make that clear. I, I'll refer to the reports if you'd rather have me do that, but I don't want there to be a charge out there floating that there is mismanagement, mismanagement abuse, or waste going on in these programs because we try very hard and go overboard to try to make sure that we do not do that. Well, what about the case that we're talking about? Well, in the first case, uh, the first case, we are in the process of getting the six trucks back. Uh, in, the se in, the second, uh, in the second case, there is a current investigation going on. In the third case of 50 vehicles missing, it was not missing. 
It was at the time, and again, this was some time ago, so I don't know all the circumstances, 1988 or 89. At the time, it wasn't that they were unaccount unaccounted for. They could not tell them exactly where they were. Oh, <laughs> well, that's, that's understandable. But they found them. But that's uh, the point. Trucks can get misplaced in a, in a large right. system, and I'm sympathetic to that. In a country as that. large as California and Texas, they can. You're right. Uh, I, I, I'm very sympathetic to that. Did you get the $100,000 back since you're uh, sensitive is, to fraud? My understanding is that this is still a case that is being handled by the inspector general, and it's one that I would... Uh, I don't know whether he could comment it on or not, frankly, if it's an investigation. So I, I will uh, let me let me undertake to uh, to check you, that you investigation, if, see if I can get back to you. You don't know if that investigation has been completed, do you? I, I believe it has not been completed, but I will find out and and uh, and let you know personally on it. Well, the Inspector General is sitting in the front row. Has the case been completed? Or if you, d if you know? Mr. The, the $100,000 which you referred to in the report um, related, related to some old information uh, regarding Foreign Service nationals, one or two individuals um, who allegedly made off with some money. There was also, at the time of our visit, some questions with respect to a former PASA turned contractor to help with the airway. That issue, that issue, not this hundred thousand dollars, is still under a investigation by our office. Not this hundred thousand. We have we have no involvement in that figure. I see. Okay. In any case, let let me go on. The um, uh, oh, he doesn't know. I just want to say a word about the Peru um, the Peru program, if I might, Mr. Chairman. I. Uh, agree with the way the uh, GAO set forth the problem. All the problems that are described in the GAO report do exist. That means a sinking economy, a very vicious insurgency, allied in many cases and financed by either drug trafficking directly or the drug traffickers in, in the sense of payments, a problem with control in the upper Huayaga Valley. Uh, and a threat that that valley could virtually pass out of the sovereignty of, uh, of the Peruvian government, uh, a, con a continuous problem with corruption, uh, which we have found in other countries as well. Uh, but what I don't agree with is the sense in the report that this is basically a hopeless situation. I think that President Fujimori, since he has come into office, has done several important things. One of the important things he's done is identified this as a Peruvian problem that he needs to solve and that he needs help with. Not saying that we have to do this as a favor to the North Americans. He has come up with a comprehensive plan. When I was there a year ago and sat with him and talked with him about his comprehensive plan, I said to, to President Fujimori, your plan basically accords with the same way we look at the problem, which means law enforcement, which means control of those areas, and which means alternative development assistance to coca farmers so that they can permanently get out of the business. He has since claimed, and, and I have reason to believe this is the case, that the coca farmers themselves, in a way, feel themselves trapped and that they feel they have no alternative source of income. It seems to me that one of the elements of our policy is to try through working all these programs together to provide at least some opportunity for a different kind of life. So that my sense of this is, while that it is a difficult, difficult uh, country, a difficult area to work with, that we have made a lot of progress, that President Fujimori has done such things as assigning for the first time aircraft to do interdiction in the, uh, in the valley, that he has promoted police cooperation, even though it's not perfect, it is getting there. And our sense is that we have made uh, that we have made some progress. So I would just let me say in, in summary, no one, no one says these are perfect programs. They are in imperfect situations we are dealing with. We're not dealing with them in the United States. We're dealing with them overseas. We are dealing in three different contextual uh, situations. Uh, the capabilities of the institutions are different in each country. The histories are different. The cultures are different. The areas are different. And we are dealing with rich, powerful, and vicious criminal organizations who have 
more flexibility, admittedly, than we do. Uh, they don't have to justify what they are doing to anybody but themselves. And they don't have to argue and define their strategy, whether publicly or, or among themselves. They can just decide what they want to do to get their poison into the United States. But I believe, even with all these problems, the record shows that we have made tremendous progress in constructing a strategy and putting it on the ground and in helping those countries cope with what is essentially a question of life or death for them. Uh, at the same time that demand seems to be coming down in the United States, this hit on supply will work well together. It will take a number of years. The first part of the strategy is a five-year uh, plan to have a substantial uh, reduction, and we expect to have that. Uh, so we believe that there is, uh, there is still a long way to go, but that the progress we have made has been substantial. And, uh, and we expect to continue with that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Well, thank you for your oral presentation that augments your written statement, which is a part of the record. I would like to uh, ask you a few questions concerning uh, starting off with uh, uh, Bolivia. Uh, do, you, do you disagree or have you any comment to make that the, the studies that we have have indicated that, that less than 1% of the coca from Bolivia is being interdicted? No idea where that figure comes from. Uh, I, I heard about this this morning that someone was quoted as saying that less than one percent. I don't know if anybody knows that because I don't know if anybody knows what the total crop is. And if somebody does, they they should tell me, and we'll see if the figure is one percent or not. What we do know, Mr. Chairman, is approximately how many hectares of coca were planted in in that area. We do have a sense of what the potential production is, but that's only potential production. That is, if every leaf of every plant were converted through the process into final cocaine hydrochloride and what that potential production might be. We do know that last year, for the first time in history, because of voluntary and forced eradication, the Bolivian government reduced the total area that was planted uh, with coca for the first time. They eradicated uh, about 8,000 hectares, and the new growth did not come in to, uh, uh, to compensate for that. But I don't know where the 1%, uh, frankly, comes from. Well, do you, do you uh, contradict it? Or I can't contradict it because I don't know the basis on well, which it is, it well, is devised. Well, the Inspector General uh, used that figure in his comments here this morning. Well, then, I don't. I didn't see that in the report to begin with. I don't think it was not in the report. So I don't know where the inspector general got his got his figure then. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Maybe I Ambassador Gelbart. Su suppose in suppose he said two percent. I would ask the same question, Mr. Chairman. I see. Suppose he said three percent. I would you don't still, know. No, no, no. It's not. The point is that I would want to know what the basis was. I then see. I would want to know on what if if if. From that particular figure, whether it's one, two, five, he judges whether a program is successful or not. And if I might, because I know Ambassador Gelbart has direct experience in this, ask him to comment on this question of how you judge success. Well, I I, 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 let me ask the questions, and you, okay. you two guys ask each other the questions some other time. I want to ask you the questions right now. Okay. Now. You, you don't know the basis upon which this statement is made, so you don't know whether it's less than 1% of the well, cocoa from Bolivia is being interdicted or whether it's more. Do you have any figure that you are able to offer now or in the future? Sure. The, uh, the reduction, uh, the total reduction, and we have a figure of, of total reduction from last year, is a figure that we consider to be relatively solid. And let us remember that uh, that we do not, that we use estimating techniques that are, uh, I think, have a certain amount of confidence, but that I cannot tell you exactly how many leaves, how many 
how many hectares are actually are actually I don't planted. think anybody has uh, ever held you to that high okay, standard. Okay, no, I'm, but I just want to this committee. I want to couch my remarks in that regard. The um, and let me and let me get you a uh, a figure here, and I'll tell you on in terms of the um, in terms of the reduction in the uh, coca growing area. Uh, Harvestable uh, cultivation, and this is published in our uh, report that we submitted in March. In 1989, was 52,900 hectares, uh, and harvestable uh, cultivation in 1990, after eradication, was 50,300 hectares. So those are those are two solid figures, and I haven't figured the percentage on that. But in any case, they are figures that we have put forth publicly. Yeah, we we are aware. Um, could I uh, turn your attention to uh, page 34? Sure. Of the report. Of the report. Uh, the do we have the same? This is this this one. Yeah. Right. Uh, the deals with the subject. Accuracy of statistics. Mm -hmm. uh, and to, to sum up this whole page, because there are other members here that wish to question, we do not consider these official statistics to be reliable and use them because they're the only ones available. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would also like to know the basis on which that statement is made, since there isn't any backup to that in the report. Well, uh, they go on to uh, say that the DEA conceded the inaccuracies in the uh, INCSR statistics. Well, I'd have to ask who but in the DEA, since the DEA pr participated in the interagency effort that produced these statistics. Well, you know, it's curious you didn't raise that uh, until just now. I mean, when I raise the question, you've got the answer. When you make the statement, it's never, you don't, you don't happen to include these, these kinds of observations. Well, wait, excuse me. The figure that I quoted you, let, let me just, I'm sorry if I was uh, not clear on this. The figure that I quoted you is a U.S. government figure that is basic, that is agreed to in a process that comes out with this report every March 1 that we produce to provide to the Congress and the DEA participates in it. I have frankly not seen anything officially that says the DEA considers this to be inaccurate. So that is all I'm saying. I'm not trying to pick a fight with you. I'm just giving you a well, we're, matter we're, of fact. Neither of us are trying to pick fights with each other. Uh, all I'm pointing out to you is that you would now like to ask me uh, what this, what, where this was uh, documented or how is it no, substantiated. No, no, not you, Mr. Chairman, the Inspector General. I'd like to know what the basis for that is. Well, uh, have, have, you, have you responded to this report? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I got this report at 4 o'clock yes yesterday afternoon, so we haven't res we responded to the official report. We have... No, no, no. I'm not talking about the completed report. I'm talking about the time for formal agency comments, which precede the publication yeah, of the report. Yeah, it's in here. It's, uh, our, I think uh -huh. our response is in yeah. I mean, our response, not signed by me, uh, my deputy is in here. Somewhere. Did you raise that in, in, in your comments, in I your response? Uh, I don't recall whether we did or not. I don't know. Frankly, there have been so many drafts of this, I'm not sure if we... Mm -hmm. what draft that we, respo we responded to. I was not the signer of the memo because I believe I was out of town. So, but I can try to find out if you can. Okay, well, let me just read the uh, summary of, of this. And I'm sorry you, you uh, have to find out who the, in the DEA conceded the inaccuracies before you'll accept them. Of course, if we give you his name and address, you might not accept them anyway. But they say on the bottom of page 34, based on our analysis of consecutive annual reports, yours, it is obvious that the figures are changed. 
The changes are not revisions of earlier estimates, but rather changes in reports of discrete results. For example, the 1989 and 1990 NCSR's report that 24 uh, cocaine uh, laboratories were destroyed in Bolivia in calendar year 1988. However, the 1991 reports that 45 such laboratories were destroyed in Bolivia in 1988. There are similar discrepancies for historical cultivation and production statistics. Yes? You want to know what the question is? Or, or does that suggest no, I can something I can, that you might want to account for? I'd be glad to, to comment on that. In fact, when we, when we do production statistics and we constantly refine our methods of collection mm -hmm. in what is admittedly not, a, not an area where you can go and actually count leaves, based on, and I have to be careful in how I describe this in an open hearing, based on uh, tried and through methods of uh, prediction on crops, the, f the figures have uh, often are changed because sometimes the methodology changes and you want to keep it consistent in the last report that you have. So rather than, than say this is the new figure, you want to give the comparative basis for the other years in the same table uh, to make it accurate. And that's all I'm saying. I the, see. It is, it is not a, a if this, if your sense is that we change these figures for political reasons, that's, that's wrong. Well, if your sense is that we change them... Why would you think them, I would imagine you do I'm anything just, like that? I don't know. Oh, perish the thought, okay, perish Mr. The thought. Secretary. The I, fact that's, is... That's ridiculous. Okay, I accept that. Except that it's in the report. You got a copy of the report. You made comments on the report. And guess what? Hmm. It's not in your comments. But you explain well, it Well, I'm now. explaining it now. Oh, I see. Well, you know how many days we might be here going through this page by page to pick up all the comments that you chose not to make about this? Well, we'd be here quite a long time. I, uh, I'm not sure what your point is, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, well, about I changing to... these figures? No, no, about, about how long it's... How long it would take to go Look, through page I, by page through the GAO and the IG report? May I just have a minute to, to just yeah, say something? I, I, look, now I'm going to give you as much time as you need. But you know, you interrupt me about more than I interrupt you. And uh, I, I just want to suggest to you, if that you don't understand what the importance of this subject is that I'm going into, I will repeat it again and make it clear. Is it clear? Yes. Oh, okay then I will now yield to you. Okay. All I wanted to say to you is that this document or the other documents uh, can be considered to be a management tool. They point to at least, we don't have, to, and we don't agree with everything that they say. And the process I found with my friend Sherman Funk back and forth over uh, a period of time in this is to work out how the government and how the people of the United States best benefit. Sometimes he changes his opinion. Sometimes I say we were wrong. But I'm not, I am not using what I consider to be some uh, off-base uh, off statements in here as a way of questioning the process, I think. It, and, I, and, I, and I don't want you to think that I do question the process. I recognize that there is a process and that it's valuable. Now, on, in terms of changing the numbers, the numbers, we have an obli every year we, we have under law uh, the obligation to produce what is called the International Narcotics Control Strategy Report. It's a very thick document. It tells, uh, the law tells us to give the best estimate of what crop production is, what results have been accomplished, particularly in the major uh, production and transit countries. We produce tables. I always shudder at these tables because we do not have perfect knowledge of these things. And frankly, the experts that produce them sometimes change their view of not only what this year's was, but what last year's was. And I feel obligated to put those changes without subjecting it to a political jawboning down straightforward. 
There is nothing sinister in this. It is a matter of my having said from the beginning, I want the experts to come to the best judgment, and we can ask questions, but let's put down what they say. And that's why we have, from year to year sometimes, a table that shows a different last year than this year, because they have refined their judgment or said that they were wrong or they didn't take something into account, and it changes. Well, they say that based on our analysis of consecutive annual reports of yours, it is obvious that the figures are changed. That is a serious accusation. And if you... It's a statement of fact. Oh, in other words, you agree with it? Absolutely. They are oh. changed. And that's why you didn't choose to comment on it uh, in, in well, your, uh, when you had an opportunity the figure, to do The so. figures are changed every year in our report if, in fact, the experts say that last year we should have include, we did not take into account or we did not have a piece of information that was included. This year we have the basis for making a judgment. Therefore, to be consistent, we should keep that factor involved across the board. Well, this seems like a pretty extraordinary example of change. 24 cocaine laboratories destroyed in Bolivia in calendar year 1988. However, the 1991 reports that in 1988 in Bolivia, 45 such laboratories were destroyed in Bolivia. Mm -hmm. Now, if that doesn't seem to you to be large enough to warrant some written comment, before I point it out to you, and then you tell me that this goes on all the time, not to be excited, trust you, that uh, wherever you see changes in numbers, what does that mean? It means we may have gone over and revised the figures because we got additional uh, reporting material. Right. Well, I don't know how we're supposed to uh, read that explanation into this report when it's not included in your opportunity to, to make comments. And I, I think it's a very serious matter, and I, I certainly don't consider it resolved uh, because you tell me that uh, we go back over and we modify the reports based on uh, later observation. I think this is a very serious charge. And this was an example of the kind of charges that are made, Mr. Secretary. I see this as a, as a serious problem, but uh, since you've told me what, what uh, has what can happen and how it can be changed, then we're going to uh, look at all of these figures a lot more closer. Let me ask you this question, uh, because uh, in the GAO report, uh, with reference to Peru, uh, it was determined that the strategy implementation has not met its stated objectives that law enforcement efforts have not achieved intended results. For example, coca cultivation is increasing according to the Drug Enforcement Administration. And coca leaf seizures have decreased from 500 metric tons in 1988 to 39 metric tons in 1990. The amount of cocaine seized in 1990 was about four metric tons the equivalent of a week's production in one town in the upper Hawaga Valley. Did, uh, did that uh, piece of information come to your attention in the course of the report? Certainly, I read the, I read the report. It has that in there. All right. Uh, you find it to be inaccurate in any way? Well, to the extent that anybody can, can judge those things, if it's taken from our, from our figures, of course it's not, it's not inaccurate. It's, it depends on how you, how you assess that along with whatever other uh, activity is going on in terms of judging the drug program. Well, we're just, we're just judging the, uh, the number of uh, uh, tons of cocaine seized. And uh, we're, we find here that the cocoa cultivation is increasing and that leaf seizures are decreasing, and the uh, amount of uh, cocaine... I, I, I trust you have no basic disagreement with those statistical conclusions. Not, a ba not any basic disagreement, no. Well, if you don't, then it, it seems to be that, uh, at least in part, much of the criticism that uh, you have scorned 
made by IG and GAO is based on these kinds of figures. I mean, is this the kind of uh, satisfactory result that, uh, that you have sought in terms of the, uh, the uh, program? Uh, it doesn't go far enough. It doesn't describe the situation accurately. Uh, if you'd like me to give our view on this, I'd be glad to. I'd like you to give your view okay. on these, uh, these uh, several figures that I've uh, well, I've, I've given them. They seem, they seem generally accurate, but they do not make up the whole picture of how we make a judgment on either the program itself or the prospects for success in the future. Well, uh, as, assuming these uh, figures not to be in dispute, as you've indicated, uh, do you disagree that the uh, stated objectives aren't being met? I mean, we're going in the wrong direction. No, I, I do disagree with that uh, because we have... Coca cultivation is increasing. That sounds like the wrong direction to me. Mm -hmm. uh, Coca leaf seizures are decreasing. That sounds like the wrong direction to me. With, nope. uh, the, uh, the amount of cocaine uh, seized uh, appears to be going down. That seems to be in the wrong direction to me. Do you agree with that? Well, let's put it this way. Uh, well, I, is that I, going in the right direction? Th no, those obviously are going in the wrong direction. Well, that's what I ask you. Well, okay, that, now it's fine. going in the wrong direction, and, and that's part of the basis for the statement that the strategy implement, implementation has not met its stated objectives. The it's law enforcement efforts have not achieved the intended results because all of these stats are going in the wrong direction. May I respond to that? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, those particular statistics uh, taken in isolation are things that we're concerned about too and of course are trying to work with the Peruvians to, uh, uh, to enhance. They do not provide the whole picture. Uh, they do not indicate, for example, that uh, the eradication program stopped in Peru because the Sendero Luminoso began to assassinate eradication workers. So the Peruvians, with our support, switched the program to what is called seedbed eradication to, in less conflictive areas in order to at least contain what was there. This does not take into account that our basic strategy changed, that we were, began to look at harassing and disrupting major trafficking organizations in all three countries concentrating, quite rightly so, on, on Colombia because the infrastructure was there, trying to at least hold the line in Peru, even with all the problems that it had, economic uh, insurgent and otherwise, and also trying to pick the program up in Bolivia, which we did to a large extent through the leadership of the ambassador, the DCM, and an invigorated narcotics control committee. So it does not uh, tell the story in terms of of uh, the, the program, or as it says, the goals not having been met. It does not indicate, for example, that particularly under President Fujimori, the base, narcotics base at Santa Lucia uh, was further improved. 200 additional police were transferred into the, into the upper Huayaga Valley. It does not indicate that reinforcement and security by the Peruvian army began to be applied to the Santa Lucia base. It does not indicate that a program uh, under, uh, under uh, a law passed by the Congress, or a bill passed by the Congress and, and signed to Peruvianize the, uh, the counter-narcotics effort uh, began to take hold and that nine pilots were trained as a part of Peruvianizing this whole effort. It does not indicate that several forward-based police interdiction operations were conducted at target labs. And it does not say that President Fujimori ordered aircraft deployed outside the uh, upper Huayaga, uh, inside the upper Huayaga Valley for flight interdiction operations beginning last January, which forced down over 50 scheduled aircraft, uh, some of them carrying large loads of narcotics. One, in fact, carried 500 kilos of, uh, of coca paste that were uh, intercepted on their way to Colombia. Uh, and it does not indicate that for the first time, particularly late this year and, and admittedly late, uh, later this year, we began to see an operation or two where the police and the military 
cooperated in going after infra uh, trafficking infrastructure. So my only point is that there is a broader picture. I don't, I don't dispute that there are problems. Uh, God knows we have fought with these problems and tried to, en uh, tried to enhance the situation as best we could. We came to the Congress and we proposed a program to provide Peru not only with the law enforcement assistance of $19 million that my bureau provides, but also with $60 million in economic support funds and $35 million in military assistance to try to get some security into the valley so that the police could operate better. Uh, the Congress, as you know, cut the military assistance and prohibited uh, assistance to the Army, which will be a severe blow in terms of security, but we'll try to work around it. So that I think uh, all I can say is that I believe that uh, the performance was not good. We wanted it better. I've said so publicly before the Congress, but we have great hopes that we can improve this in the future, and that's what I believe the Congress and others Would you hold want us for just a moment? Let the sure. stenographer make a change. I'm sorry to be so lengthy, but I did want to give a, a, a picture of how we see this Peru program. Well, taking in about 10 variables that you have just recited at some length, uh, it still leaves us with a bottom line. Uh, I have no way to dispute or, or, or validate any of, of the uh, actions that you have added on to the necessity to understand whether you're meeting objections or not. But at the bottom line of all of this, we have to look at one thing. Is cocoa cultivation increasing or not? Is leaf seizures decreasing or not? If the, is the amount of cocaine seized going down or not? That, those are the finite end of the, the line conclusions that we make on all of the programs that are going on. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if those are in dispute or not. Uh, I remember it was the uh, President Fujimura who uh, initially turned down the military aid. Uh, the, not us. The Congress responded after it. Uh, it was him. And I, I think that it might be misleading for anybody listening to this discussion uh, not to know that that is really uh, an accurate uh, part of of uh, this discussion about whether this strategy is working or not. In, now, th there, were, there were raised uh, the questions about uh, the Peru certification and that there were these seven obstacles that GAO pointed out uh, that uh, relate to Peru's ability to institute effective control over military and police, to improve coordination and cooperation between Peru's military and police, to control airports, and I'll come back to that, to combat two insurgent groups, to reduce corruption, reduce human rights abuses, and to decrease economic dependence on cocoa cultivation. And these are, are difficult obstacles, uh, conceded. Uh, the question, though, is how do you address these and, and how do you see them being met and whether you think that these are valid observations uh, included in the GAO uh, report? Absolutely valid observations. I don't disagree with any of them. They, pr they are obstacles. There is no doubt. Shows what kind of job we have to do in Peru. Shows that we need to be engaged with the Peruvian government. Uh, shows that we need to have a, a common strategy with them to go strongly after the drug trade, which they want to do and which we want to do. But you're absolutely right, Mr. Chairman, and so is the GAO. This is not easy. It is a tough situation out there. And there are Peruvians and Americans putting themselves in the line to try to make it, uh, to imp improve the situation and get something done to keep Peruvian originated cocaine off the streets of the United States. That's the bottom line. We can't ignore Peru because 60% of the cocaine, we figure, I, I think that's probably, that 
much as people say I think it's a good estimate, originates in that valley. Now, but it is tough. And you know that with the Sendero Luminoso, which is probably the most vicious insurgent group around today, with the drug traffickers and with the, uh, the money that they're able to spend and the, f the forces they're able to bring to bear, it is a tough thing to do. But our policy is to engage with the Peruvian government to try to work against that. We are convinced that President Fujimori wants to do that as well. So I agree with those, uh, and I'm glad, in fact, I'm glad the GAO brought them out in their report because they indicate how difficult the situation is, but we've got to keep going on it. Well, I know we have to keep going on it. That's why we're holding these hearings, to help you keep going Good. on it. Since Good. we provide the funds and approve the policies, the, the, the question, though, that I think is legitimate in, in a hearing of this nature is what are we doing to address these obstacles and how effective are they? And if I did not notice them in your written statement, I would appreciate any additional written comments sure. directed about them. Uh, they are, uh, Mr. Chairman, they are, they are, they are addressed in my, uh, in my written statement, but we'd be glad to, uh, in response to any particular questions you have, give you, provide you with more information. I would say, in general, despite the difficulty of each one of those elements that are cited, we have and are working with the Peruvians to try to deal with them, whether it's at a political level with the government or whether it's through some equipment or training that we can provide or, mil or assistance, whether it's military or law enforcement. Each of those have to be addressed. absolutely right, and we will, we will continue to address them and well, provide I'll, whatever I'll information you'd as, like. I will need as a specific response to each one. Again, uh, that is good. a general statement of intentions. I know that uh, they're excellent and well motivated. Uh, it, it hardly suffices at an oversight hearing uh, for me to be told that uh, you agree that these are the obstacles and we're working like the devil on them and we, we concede that they're formidable. Uh, what I need to try to elicit from you, if it is possible, some precise response to each one of the seven items. Okay. Take item three, for example. Uh, this July, defense officials stated that the traffickers continue to use the airports with little or no restraint from military or police forces. Peru has 356 registered and an estimated 40 unregistered airports, of which 58 are controlled by the Civilian Aeronautics Agency and nine by the military. The remaining airports, according to a U.S. Embassy official, are privately owned and not under government control. Effective aerial interdiction of drug trafficking requires government control of airports. Now, Secretary Levitsky, as long as we're not controlling the airports, the whole game is up, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, if, if they have a literally unrestrained access to these uh, airports, literally, uh, then it seems to me that all of the other programs, no matter how well crafted and motivated, are not going to amount to anything and that we will continue to come back to these uh, decreasing leaf seizures, uh, mm -hmm. increasing uh, 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 cocaine uh, seizures, are going down and cocoa cultivation increasing. Uh, the, the answer does not require too much of an uh, elaborate inquiry because the access to the air is fairly unrestrained, not entirely, but to a great, uh, to a great degree there is open access to the air for these drug smugglers. Now, can you tell me how you responded to this part of the GAO report? I certainly can. Uh, let me point out, one, that it's only within the last month that we have got uh, authorization and appropriation of the military assistance uh, from, the, uh, from the Congress and that 10 million of what we asked for for the Army was cut off. That is just as a preface to what I'm going to say. The Air Force, the, the uh, 
Military assistance that we plan to give to the Air Force, and again, we have to, because we just got this, have to discuss this very thoroughly with the, with the uh, Peruvian government, is designed to deal with the question of sovereignty of airspace to help the Peruvian government through providing spare parts, getting their aircraft uh, up and flying on a regular basis and providing training to gain control of their airspace. Now those planes that come in from Colombia violate their territorial integrity in their airspace and land on airstrips. Uh, some of those airstrips nominally are under the control of the government. But what you find is because you have poorly equipped, in fact sometimes under-equipped uh, army units uh, uh, s near the airport, they can't come out because the, in many cases the Sendero Luminoso protects the flights coming in and they will get slaughtered. So one, this is something we have to work through. We don't have money now for the army because of the cuts. We will have to figure out a better, a good way of doing it and we may have to, we may have to put more money into Air Force so that when the flights come in there can be at least some stoppage by some air element. But I don't want to go into uh, I don't want to go into detail on that because I don't want to uh, provide uh, information that could uh, help benefit uh, trafficking organizations. With a dollar budget, I'm sorry that we cut off $10 million from defense, but, but if that's the reason that we have an a, uh, uncontrolled airspace over Peru, uh, then golly, we, we ought to vote out some more money and maybe uh, add it to the $2.2 billion and then we'll get some, some uh, planes in to assist, assist the government in, in uh, controlling their own airspace. Well, I t uh, that's, that's, that's one way to look at it, but I don't think it'll get you much sympathy up here. Well, I don't know about, uh, I'm not interested in sympathy, uh, Mr. Chairman, but I am, all I was trying to point out to you is that we came up with a specific report, request that had a specific purpose to it. It was cut. We will, all I am saying to you is that we have money that was authorized and appropriated by the Congress. That question of airports is very important. We are going to have to probably concentrate our efforts with the Peruvian Air Force rather than on depending on the uh, on the army being engaged in a more vigorous way against these uh, uh, to gain control of these airports. Would it be unreasonable to su to suggest that maybe we ought to suspend the Andean strategy then until we get the money in for the aircraft? Because no, of course not. Well, if if you don't get the money in for the aircraft and we have unprotected airspace, the whole strategy goes down the drain. In my oh, no. in my Book. No, that, I don't. I don't agree with that, Mr. Chairman. Well, if they're taking there out, if they're growing more drugs and exporting more drugs, uh, I don't. I don't know what's left of our strategy. And, and this much, you've uh, been kind enough to concede in the course of our discussion this afternoon. I well, mean, I what's don't, left? Uh, I don't. I, I don't quite. I'm sorry. I don't understand what you're saying. If you're saying abandon the strategy because we can't gain control of airports, I think that's not correct. There are other elements of our strategy which I tried to lay out for you in detail that are also important to well, they're, controlling they're, they're the problem. They're exceedingly important. But what do they amount to if in fact uh, every smuggler in Peru can jump in his private plane and fly the hell out of there? But I mean, now, the you, don't need, you don't need to be in the State Department to figure that no matter how much money we're putting in there, whether it's two billion or twenty billion, as long as they control the air and they're growing more and apparently uh, we're, we're catching less, it seems to me that the strategy on, on those fundamental premises is failing, regardless of how many dozen other programs are moving along rather well. I'm sorry, but what is your suggestion then, Mr. Chairman? I already suggested it. Maybe if we, if we, if 2.2 billion dollars isn't enough to provide aircraft, to, I mean, if you haven't figured out that until we gain <laughs> control of the airways, there, there's no way we're going to stop that poison from coming out of, of out of uh, the Andean countries. And if, and if you're telling me that we don't have enough money to do that. 
and that now, according to our own government, that these traffickers are using the airports in this country with little or no restraint, then all I'm suggesting to you is that we get somebody in and, and start uh, building up a uh, aircraft cooperative system to stop the drugs from going out. But that's what we're doing. That's what I said we're doing. And I what see. I said to you is that apparently your view is not shared by by, the, uh, by some people in the Congress who clipped $10 million, which we thought would go a long way towards solving that problem, from what we requested. That's what I'm suggesting. But if you want to abandon the Andean strategy, if that's the suggestion, then I think the total result is going to be you're going to see much more cocaine coming to this country and on the streets of, the, uh, of our cities. Well, well, maybe so, but if they're leaving out now with little or no restraint, how much more can they send over here? But that is the purpose of what we wanted to do with the military assistance money, is to try to make sure that they did not leave okay, without restraint. What do you restraint. do now? Pardon me? Can you estimate when we will have some uh, air cover that will give us a different report than the one that I'm reading to you from today? We we already uh, do have some air cover on a sporadic basis. When we, when we bring uh, what I consider a relatively modest but effective use of money to bear on the Peruvian Air Force, we will have much better coverage than they will have much better coverage, I have to put it in their terms, than they have now. President Fujimori, as I mentioned earlier, has in fact assigned certain aircraft to the upper Huayaga Valley. Uh, both jets and, uh, and propeller planes. They have already shown that they can interdict uh, and, and force down uh, aircraft, that they are capable of doing it. Uh, it needs to be a program that is upgraded. That's the purpose of our requesting the money. It came, unfortunately, very late in the fiscal year. It will take a while to get it going, but we will have training and equipment to deal with that problem, and I can assure you that it will that it will improve and address the very problem that you're that you have that you have uh, noted. Well, that's great. We'll we'll be waiting uh, from between this report and the next report to see what's happening. But I won't be able to express any more shock or surprise when uh, when I meet when I have met with you today, and we've agreed that cocoa cultivation is increasing, that cocoa leaf seizures are decreasing, and that uh, cocaine seized in 1990 is going down, and that the airports have unrestricted uh, use by the traffickers. I don't, I don't need to know much else about why this poison is flowing into the United States at record-breaking clips, and leading one of our uh, experts to testify that we're interdicting in one country only about 1% of the cocoa uh, uh, from that particular country. Now, let me, I see that Mr. Rangel is here, and uh, I want to uh, ask you this question that I hesitate to say it'll be the final one, but it's getting a little late in the day. We're prepared to stay as long as, as, long as you like. Well, thank you for your cooperation. The IG's Bolivia report observes the communication problems seen in 1988 have not been fixed. Page 53. Six of the 16 helicopters do not have high-frequency radios. Uh, the gentleman from California, Al McCandless, uh, referred to this in earlier testimony this morning. The new radios and avionics purchased by the State Department were not installed because of a squabble between the U.S. Embassy and Mr. Levitsky's office in Washington over who had to pay for this installation. Instead of doing one comprehensive study, there were two separate competing communication studies being done. Now, may I ask why this matter has not been resolved in terms of the Bolivia situation? We, uh, all I could, could you give me the page of that again so I can refer to the specifics, please? Oh, I got the wrong report.
seems as if there was a dispute between the International Narcotics Matters Office and the U.S. Embassy, with your name being particularly mentioned. Yeah. Uh, I, I think this is the, uh, the uh, what I referred to uh, uh, earlier about in internal management and controls. Uh, and again, I will get you, uh, I will get you the details on this. The fact is that there have there has been a question about what kind of communication system to employ, what would be the most uh, effective, and what would, what would link up with other uh, communication systems as we expand and help the Bolivians expand their program into the areas beyond the Chapari Valley. So I don't, uh, I mean, I certainly agree with the uh, recommendation, which is to provide them with a copy of the communication study as well as a plan for implementation and funding, and we will certainly do that. I want to make sure in all these programs that we, uh, because unfortunately, and I think uh, this has been shown in some uh, previous reports, there have been decisions made which later proved not to have been wise, and I frankly do not want to spend uh, our money on something that turns out not to be the right thing. I believe, for example, some of the problems that it cites here in the Riverine program are, are right on target, and we're trying to get that in shape. So I don't. Uh, I mean, I don't take that as an unwarranted uh, criticism. Well, do you know the radios are still in Florida and that the helicopters still don't have radios? That sounds like a life-endangering situation to me. It seems that one that should have been resolved well, all, in more than a three-year period. All the helicopters have radios. It's a matter of upgrade. All, I'm, I'm told by my staff here that all the radios are down in, are not in Florida, but down in Bolivia. And let, let me point out uh, just one more. Well, wait a minute. Who on your staff said that? I just want his name for the record because I've got the IG telling me something completely different. Well, I don't know when the IG uh, made his report. I said that. Okay? Well, you know, I, I seem to, to sense a, a problem that we have here. You say now that they're on, the, the IG report said that they haven't been on, and you said now that everybody has uh, radios. I said and it's they're, okay. all, they're all in, in uh, Bolivia now. They're all in Bolivia, but yeah. they're not they're installed. They're not installed, no. Okay. Has, they have radios and they can't communicate with each other. Is that fair not, to say? Not exactly, uh, not exactly the okay. case. They can. What, what's the correct statement? I'm not, I'm not a pilot, so I'm a, but, I, but I, I am told that, um, uh, that they can communicate, but not uh, with the, um, uh, the breadth of the communication that they would have uh, with the new systems that need to be installed. Okay. Well, is there, is there any possible way that just picking this one item out of an all-day hearing, mm -hmm. Uh, is there any way that this is, can be resolved from the... Pardon me? I'm sorry. I, I say picking one item out of mm -hmm. all the items we've talked about today, wouldn't it be great if we could not only get the radios to Absolutely. Bolivia, get them onto the planes and get them operational? Because I think that uh, from what I hear about some of our, our our men and women that are working down there, that there's a certain amount of danger involved and that they need to have radios that are working. Can we get them put in and, the, uh, and we find out that, that sure. it's really working? We're, obviously, we have the same goal to put them in, but let me point something out. Okay. This helicopter program that we have in Bolivia under the mo one of the most difficult situations that helicopters fly, and especially Hueys, has had 15,000 hours of accident-free flying. It is the safest program. One of the criticisms in this IG report about low, low hours for utilization is because we have made sure that this is the safest possible program that we can have. So I, obviously we want to make it as, sa as safe as we can and we continually upgrade. But I want to point out that the record is there and it speaks for itself. 
Accident, 15,000 accident free. That's over a couple well, of years. That's pretty good. Well, you've changed the subject on me, but it's okay. Well, you asked about safety, Mr. Chairman. You keep saying that I'm changing the subject. I'm trying to answer your questions. No, I ask you about when we could get the radios that are in Bolivia now functioning on all the planes. And you tell me about safety. But since you want you to talk safety. about safety, and I want to talk about safety, uh, it seems that they would be a lot safer if they had high-frequency radios for which we paid and that have not yet been installed because of a squabble. And that they're not working, that they're not in Florida, they're in Bolivia, they're on the planes, they're not working yet. And so that seems to me to be a very important safety factor. Absolutely, now, but I, I do not accept the word squabble. That is a deliberation based on I don't accept the word squabble, because I believe what that is is a decision based on looking at all the arguments and on, on based on looking at, all, at the best possible system we could put in. We have had, I'm told, an avionics expert in Bolivia for the last 45 days to resolve this issue. He's a U.S. Air Force Master Sergeant, so I'm going to assure you right here and let you know when, in fact, we have them on, because I know you're interested in it. We are, too. Okay. Uh, could it be as soon as uh, the month of October 1991 or November 1991? I would certainly hope so. Well, I would too. Well, I thank you for, for that cooperation. Now, uh, with reference to the safety-free uh, hours that, that we've been flying helicopters, I turn to uh, Bolivia and the IG report on page 43 it is noted that the United States provided helicopters uh, at a very low rate and that the helicopters are being used less and less from 30 to hours a week in 1988 to 35 hours a week in 1989 to 34 hours in 1990 uh, hours a, this is hours a month not hours a week 30 hours a month in 1988 to 35 hours a month in 1989, to 34 hours a month in 1990, to 23 hours a month in 1991 uh, during the January to May period. And then, despite this continued downward trend in monthly use, there are plans for six more helicopters in 1991 and then six more in 1992. Could you explain to me the logic of adding helicopters when their monthly usage is down to a mere 23 hours a month? I sure can. Please do. First place, this, this part of the report represents a complete misunderstanding of what the helicopter program is in Bolivia. The utilization of helicopters, particularly in the past, uh, was more or less in the mode of fly up, search and destroy, see what's out there, look for paste pits. What these helicopters have been used for, particularly since we've been able to get the reach to go out into further areas than this Chapari Valley, is to go after planned and based on intelligence operations that would hit at the major organizations. You are not going to get high utilization rates. You need more helicopters because you're not flying up every day to just fly around. You need more helicopters because as a result of the successful program in the Chapari and in Santa Cruz and in some of these other areas where we're beginning to go, the trafficking has been forced further north into Bolivia. Bolivia is the size of Texas and California combined. It is a big country. I don't believe it is, that it is beyond the realm of possibility to say that in an interdiction force uh, that has to chase the trafficking around and, base, and do it strategically, that it is beyond the realm of thought that we should have something like 22 helicopters. Now, the figures that you see here, this is called a standard. This is not really what I would call a standard, nor is this, this 40 that you see here in this report. What we did in the 40, unfortunately, because we were toward the end of the fiscal year short, short budgeted, we said, do not go above, above 40 in utilization, right? Otherwise, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll run out of money. That was the essence of that. And I regretted that, but I had to sign the cable out saying that. Uh, and the embassy then had to adjust its operational planning and its the basis for what it was going to do to what 
we could afford because we didn't want to go anti-deficient. So what I'm saying to you is that we need more helicopters and, and if we're successful we may need even more to chase the traffickers out of Bolivia. They keep moving around. The helicopters that we put auxiliary fuel tanks on to get more range, for example, because they're mo the, the, heli the traffickers are trying to move beyond the range of operations, can carry fewer people because you have to use up the space with auxiliary fuel tanks and we want to go chase them. So I think that the program is well justified. We have thought it through. We have considered uh, all the possibilities. I don't think it is an inordinate number. I believe they are well planned and well utilized and well coordinated and I have uh, uh, absolutely no hesitation at all in supporting the need for six additional helicopters in, a, in an area of that size. Well, if you're using uh, one helicopter 23 hours a month and your own INM standard is 50 hours a month, could you explain to me why you couldn't take uh, the same number of helicopters without adding more and have them fly more hours? Yeah, because you can't split a helicopter in half if you've got one in one area of the country and one 300 miles away. And let me go back to this, this idea of planning. Some of those helicopters are used for training. Some of them are under repair. They're, they're Huey, so they, we need to watch very carefully how they're maintained and repaired. You don't have, in other words, out of 22, all 22 up and functioning. What we hope to do is to be able to have a sufficient number of helicopters so that we will be able to forward base some of them in areas where there is trafficking and go after strategic in, uh, installations based on intelligence and planning, not fly up. We could send the hours way up, but, they but I don't think that they would really, it would really pay us to do that. It would just be cost, it would cost us more money in terms of fuel, in terms of maintenance, in terms of pilot time, and we wouldn't get a result. I prefer this kind of plan, which I might say, and I, and I have to say this about Ambassador Gelbart under his leadership, was, was very carefully thought out using DEA, intelligence resources, military, and through the coordinated mechanism of the, of the Narcotics Committee to come up with a plan that would make sense and have an effect. And we've seen the results which are laid out in my statement. Well, I've seen the results too, and they're the ones that we're, uh, we've agreed on uh, several times, that, uh, that uh, cocaine seizure is down, coca leaf production is up, and uh, you're talking about Peru. I oh, that's right. Bolivia. I'm I'm in uh, Bolivia now. Mm -hmm. Well, Bolivia. If you look at this, if, if you look at statistics, those two things are exactly the opposite of what you said. In other words, production area of production is down, seizures are up. Yeah, uh, that, particularly that was, hits uh, at organizations are up. Considerably. That was the statement uh, that we received in testimony that one percent of the cocoa from Bolivia is being interdicted. No, I. I I don't know what to make of that statement. I don't know where it came from, to tell you, as I said before. Well, I know where it came from. I, I didn't ask them to prove every, uh, every uh, statement in, in this uh, testimony here. I, I think we could be here a lot longer if, if, if we had to make every witness, including yourself, prove every statement. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that... I don't know. Uh, I, feel, I feel a little bit like you're trying to make me prove every statement, but that's just an impression. Well, I think it is impressionistic because uh, you've been responding to my questions and all of these answers which we had plenty of opportunity to have resolved in your written comments that were forwarded to you the time before publication, uh, I am not sure of, of where they are if they're in here. In other words, uh, by discrediting the reports, I guess, of both the GAO and the IG, you've come here now to I, I, uh, explain uh, each of the questions that I've raised. I've got uh, many, many more, but it seemed to me that you didn't take advantage of the process, Secretary Levitsky. It, it seems to me that you neglected that process, and it's done this hearing a great disservice. Uh, Pardon me, not with regard to the OIG report, but with regard to the two GA, uh, GAO reports, we did not have an opportunity to provide, we were specifically not asked to provide written comments, and I believe that's contained in the letter to you that is part of this package. And uh, so my response to these reports, which I think is a measured response, 
is, is my response right now. To, I've read them and I'm giving you a response. Presumably we will now have 30 days, 30 days to give a written response as I understand yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. The GAO report to the state is the only agency that can the Exeter Tribune on the GAO reports. Well, I have staff uh, explaining that uh, State Department alone refused to comment on uh, exit interviews, which they had an opportunity uh, to do before these were published. And uh, I, I want to say to you, sir, uh, now that I'm beginning to figure out how the State Department operates, I'm not going to ever get caught in this bind again. This will be the first and last time for that. But I want to tell you that if we had to sit around every hearing and have everybody, every witness respond to a prepared, submitted report only at the time that they come to the hearing, each hearing would take hours and hours, much longer than this one is taking. And so I'm going to... Uh, uh, submit to you any uh, comments and questions that I, I would like to uh, continue on in this discussion. We've only touched on a few of them, and uh, some of your responses have been very cooperative, and I appreciate them because they, uh, they confirm uh, at least some of the direction that, the, uh, that these studies uh, have been, been uh, operating and moving toward. Let me well, ask, in, uh, pardon, pardon me, Mr. Yes. Chairman. The, the draft report, I, I have had about four copies of this. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not irritated, but I just want to say one thing. The draft report I read said this. This is on Peru. GAO did not obtain written agency comments on this report. We did, however, discuss the contents of a draft of this report with officials from the Department of State and Defense, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and the Office of National Drug Control Policy and incorporated agency comments where appropriate. Now, in the, uh, uh, and I think the same comment uh, is made in the, uh, in the final report, or somewhat the same comment, at least it says, as arranged with the requesters, GAO did not request written agency comments on a draft of this report. So I, I'm not sure that I am being tarred with refusing to submit written comments when I was, when in fact it was specifically asked that we not provide written comments. My understanding, maybe I'm wrong about the process, my understanding is that now that these reports have been issues, issued, we will have 30 days, I believe, to respond in writing and make our comments on them. And that's what we will do. And you will see those and then you will have to make a judgment on whether our comments are appropriate or not. But that was always my understanding. When you called this hearing, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and pardon me, I've been traveling and, and, and working on some other issues, but my understanding was that you wanted us to give our comments on the reports that the GAO and the OIG provided. We had some drafts, and I looked at them and studied them. And last night, I read the three final reports for the first time. Some of, the, some of it was the same as what I had read. Some of it was, uh, some parts had been deleted for good reasons, for classification purposes. And so really, I, all I am saying to you is that I don't believe, I don't believe that if, if you believe that we are being uncooperative, I am trying to answer your questions. And pardon me for, I'm trying to be as honest as I can. Whether we responded in writing or not, all I can do to you is try to give you the best answer to your questions. And that's what I am doing. But I have to say that I think the process as I understood it, was the way I described it. And maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe I didn't take enough time to learn about how this process operated. But my understanding was you wanted these oral comments. I read the reports last night. And that we would have then 30 days to respond in writing, which would be a more measured kind of way of dealing with it, because we'll have more time to think about what our response is. And I, I, if I'm wrong, I apologize. Well, I. Uh after I got a, a uh, after I called uh, Secretary Aronson to, to come over here today, and he said he never had heard about it, uh, I'm s I'm sending him the letter dated October 10th uh, uh, because he didn't even know there were hearings that he was supposed to attend. After we got a cutoff 
phone call last night at 8 p.m. indicating that he would not be here to testify with you uh, today. No, I, I know you, you, you don't know anything about that, but I, well, I put it I on the something. record because it's, something. it's from, from the, the State Department, and uh, mm -hmm. I had expected both of you to testify today. Uh, all I can comment on that, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, the staffs have been, uh, our staff and your staff have been talking with each other. I believe it was clear from the beginning, as far as I understood anyway, that, uh, that I would testify based because these were basically on the drug program and that either Ambassador Gelbard or if he was called away to a meeting in, in, on Haiti in Paris, which was a possibility, uh, Ambas or, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary McLean would come with me. So maybe there's a misunderstanding here. If so, uh, we apologize for that. But I never thought from the beginning, nor did Bernie, Bernie Aronson think from the beginning, that he was uh, that he was going to come to these hearings. Yeah, that, so maybe that's right. The, the letter I uh, sent him on October 10th, d directly addressed to him, inviting him to testify, uh, was uh, was uh, I don't know what what you're supposed to make out of that. But please don't try to account for him because, as you said, you didn't know what he was doing, okay, no. and that's that's a separate matter. Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, I think I could speak for him and say that we were completely unaware of that. And my understanding all along, based on discussions that I understood were being held with your staff, were that I was going to come to testify, and I rearranged my schedule so as to be here. Well, I'm, I'm glad you did, but nobody knew about it. We've, we've got a, all I've got is the letter I sent to uh, the Assistant Secretary himself, Mr. Aaron. Which is dated when? October 10th, 1991. When, when did well, let's let's not try to ago. solve it. I've already expressed my uh, well. I just want, if you consider him. it a matter of concern, I want to try to clear it up for you. But well, uh, I don't know if I can or not. Anyway, I, I, th I thank you it, for your it. attempt, and I thank you for your testimony. I'm glad to see Ambassador Gelbard again, and uh, we will be in communication with you in writing uh, for other questions that we would have raised had not the the day uh, proceeded uh, so late. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to let him testify. Oh, you're going to let him testify? Yeah. No, I have, no, I have nothing else. I see my, Mr. my friend, Mr. Rand. Yes. Uh, rather than testify, I would ask uh, unanimous consent to, uh, to have my statement appear in the record. And, and uh, since the secretary was gracious enough to say that he would stay for a few minutes. I, I would like to inquire if the chair might permit. Well, I, I will permit, uh, since the gentleman from New York is, has requested it. He's welcome to this committee at all times. I uh, he heads up the uh, Narcotics Abuse Committee, and I recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Charles Rangles. I ask unanimous consent that the statement I was to make before this committee be put into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. and. Uh, let me welcome uh, the, the witnesses, uh, Ambassador Gelbart and Assistant Secretary uh, of State Levitsky. Uh, over the uh, Columbus Day uh, recess, I had the opportunity to accompany uh, Chairman uh, uh, Torricelli uh, with uh, Congressman uh, Laga Messina and Congressman Solars and the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State uh, uh, Phil uh, McLean. Uh, to Peru and Colombia, uh, uh, Peru and Colombia, and uh, we did meet uh, with the presidents of both countries. And uh, in Peru, uh, we had the opportunity to be briefed on the eradication program, the crop substitution program, rather, uh, by uh, Dr. De Soto, and supported uh, by the president. I uh, was very impressed uh, with the. Uh, with the program, um, and we talked with the uh, coca leaf farmers, and uh, and uh, really thought that uh, this president had made a commitment to uh, stamp out corruption and to bring the military and the police working more closely together, and to get some type of handle on the abuses in terms of human rights, uh, not only by the bandit guerrillas, but certainly by members of his own government. Uh, that's the good part. The bad part is that I've never really seen a Peruvian plan that I didn't like because uh, uh, over the years, no matter how many 
millions or indeed billions of dollars we've poured into eradication programs. We always end at the end of the year with bumper crops and, uh, and with a feeling that maybe the next administration would be better. We left there and we went to Colombia, and, and certainly uh, the president of Colombia doesn't really need anybody to uh, say kind things about him. His, courageous, his courage is a symbol, I think, for the entire world leadership to see uh, how he has stood up to the bandits uh, in Colombia and how with U.S. assistance, and I might say just U.S. assistance, uh, he's attempting to set up a court system and that would not uh, force him to uh, push for eradication, but to have a criminal justice system that South Americans and Colombians would know that they can take care of their own. Uh, one of the problems that we have, and I, and I like to pause to thank the chairman for his vigorous pursuit of finding answers to the problem that the world has, the country has, and the nation has, I, I only regret that every standing committee did not pursue every one of these issues as vigorously as you have in terms of not trying to find out whether it's working, but is there a policy, is there a strategy, can the Congress provide some type of oversight so that in this so-called war, uh, we are marching together with full understanding what's going on. Um, I could see and feel the frustrations that you feel uh, sitting at that uh, table. But you have no idea the frustrations that I feel when the Secretary of Education has no program for prevention, when the Secretary of Health hasn't the slightest idea as to how effective the treatment programs are uh, that we have in the communities. And certainly when the military, who have just come in and started doing a wonderful job in interdiction, say that all the equipment has been pulled out to, to the Persian Gulf. It seems to me that, that you cannot deny that whatever progress that we have now in Bolivia, Colombia, and Peru has been due to the President's leadership in setting up the Andean Conference in Cartagena. And it was from that initiative that countries came together, start talking in areas of mutual respect. Why Ecuador has been left out, why uh, Venezuela has been left out, why we don't see drug traffickers running all around South America, and why we don't see a return, and I'm only talking as a citizen and as a member of Congress, of that leadership of the president to have another Cartagena, to have a follow through, to be able to tell the American people in Latin America what we have accomplished and to support the leadership we have down there before they too get assassinated as leaders have before them. And a lot of emphasis is made about how much money we're spending. But I don't know who, who would be in charge of the foreign policy as relates to the drug strategy? You know, it's almost a rhetorical question because you would say Secretary Baker, and I would not deny it, but we would have no idea what Secretary Baker's views are on this subject because uh, uh, the $11 billion that we spend in terms of the war gets less national attention than the $10 billion loan guarantee for Israel. And the president's on the tube, he has press conference, Secretary Baker responds, and so the whole Congress, every constituent knows which way their member is on a loan guarantee. And yet we haven't the slightest idea in terms of putting the strategy together as to is there one person that can come talk about the different countries, talk about interdiction? We had the best briefing, Mr. Chairman, that you could have from the military in Panama. We know the routes that the, the airplanes are taking, the couriers are taking. They're not even disrupted. It's from the beginning to the end, and yet uh, we find that the Peruvians and the Colombians don't have enough trained pilots to do anything about it. And so I hope that you might encourage your Secretary uh, Baker and the President, as I will, uh, to not only 
reconvene Cartagena or reconvene the Andean uh, countries. But uh, if Mr. Martinez is still the coordinator of the grand strategy, uh, to have more statements going out as to each part of the strategy and how it's working, and perhaps that would give the Congress a sophistication enough, at least on the other side of the Capitol, to reserve the $10 million that we kept in our side of the aid package. I thank you for your patience, Mr. Chairman. Well, I, I thank you, and uh, I know that the Secretary would want to respond to yes, that. I, I would, and I... Uh, combination question and, and statement. Comment. And we, of course, uh, I have been before the, the Chairman's uh, uh, committee a number of times, uh, and I certainly respect his, uh, his views very much. He is uh, someone who has supported our effort over the years. We're appreciative. I think we have seen it. I've been on, on trips with him. And I think we have, he has supported not only within the Congress, but with foreign governments. He's been a strong voice for our policy and for, uh, for our interests uh, directly. I've seen, I've seen this overseas, uh, talking with presidents of other countries. So I, I very much respect uh, what he says. Um, and, and I know and I hope he believes that having gone through our hearings, we've expressed a strategy that at one point he told me he thought was the best strategy he'd ever heard about. He hoped that it would be implemented properly, as, as do I. Some of what I've said today, I think, indicates that we have made a tremendous amount of progress with uh, help particularly from the people in the Congress who have taken a particular interest in this. I know that the chairman, uh, the chairman of the select committee in, in this case, uh, Mr. Rangel, uh, has asked me a number of times about uh, Secretary Baker, who is the head of foreign policy. Secretary Baker is certainly uh, the president's chief advisor on foreign policy, although the, pre the president determines policy. I would like to enter, if I might, for the record, because I think it's important, a, uh, a message that Secretary Baker sent uh, just a month ago, less than a month ago, to uh, every uh, embassy and consulate in the world, as well as to all his assistant secretaries, which I think is an eloquent uh, statement of where, how far we have come and what we need to do to further weave this drug thread into the fabric of our foreign policy, which is a challenge. Uh, I know that uh, Mr. Rangel has um, continually been on us, and I think it's good to do better. Uh, I would point out, uh, however, that there is uh, some shared blame in some, in some of this. I was uh, asking the, uh, the drug czar's office today about how we're doing on budget, because I know our budget has already uh, been cut by one committee of the Congress by $21 million. I don't know how that will come out in conference. But I find that there has been a tendency within the, uh, and it's not just the, con uh, not just the House of Representatives, but others, to cut the money that was asked for DEA, to cut the treatment funds, um, to cut various uh, elements of uh, the Health and Human Services requests. There are probably good explanations. I'm not responsible for the domestic aspect. And I, and I know that the, uh, the chairman will, will certainly fight to restore money where he believes it's warranted. But uh, I think that both the, the credit and, and to a certain extent the blame, I don't like to put it that way really, but it is to be shared uh, by all of us. And I think that um, you saw the difficulty of the Peru situation. Uh, you've seen it before. And as I said to you, Mr. Chairman, uh, acknowledging all the problems, we have got to still find ways of grappling with that issue. We cannot ignore uh, thank that. You, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's been an important exchange. I, uh, if anyone gets the idea I was pleased with the State Department's performance today, then I probably was masking some of my feelings about what went on. And I thank uh, my colleague I'm Charles so Rangel for joining I'm, I'm, us. I didn't understand. Are you saying that you weren't pleased with the State Department's performance? Yes, sir. I, w I was not pleased with it. I remain unhappy about it. And I, I'm sorry that we, we leave on this note, but we're going to have further hearings and uh, well, we will submit statements and, and writing to you. But uh, this has not been a positive hearing from this chairman's point of view. I thank you, though, very much for your participation.
The subcommittee stands adjourned. I'm never going to let him test. Join us Tuesday morning at 8 o'clock Eastern Time for a live viewer call-in program focusing on health care legislation. Joining us is Republican Senator David Durenberger of Minnesota, who last week introduced health care reform legislation on Capitol Hill. He will also discuss civil rights and tax cut proposals with C-SPAN viewers. That's Tuesday morning beginning at 8 o'clock Eastern Time here on C-SPAN. C-SPAN is a proud member of Cable in the Classroom. This nonprofit organization encourages use of cable programs.